bring the state's attorneys. Anything to bring up before we bring the jury in? Not from the state, no. Defense, I plead defense. Please bring the jury in. Thank you. Charles Harvey. And for the record, he is on Zoom, Your Honor. Uh, Dr. Harvey is not here. That's correct. For present, for he is on Zoom here. And you are Dr. Harvey. I am. Raise your right hand, sir. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God. I do. Over your hand. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Can you state your name for the record, please? Charles Minor Harvey, MD. Doctor, let's just talk a little bit about your health condition you know, while you're on Zoom, okay? Yes, sir. So, um, back a couple of weeks ago, I think we had a hearing, or a week ago, we had a hearing about determining whether you could testify by Zoom due to your health condition. Uh, do you have health problems that prevent you from traveling long distances? Yes, I do. Matter of fact, the, the health problems you have, do they keep you, it's difficult for you to even travel to doctor's appointments 30 minutes away from your home? Yes, uh, the distance, the some of the doctor's appointments is maybe 30 miles, and I'm pretty much really uncomfortable by the time I get home. Now, your doctor's recommended that you not travel, is that correct? That is correct. Doctor, uh, where do you live right now? I live in Bernie, Texas, B-O-E-R-N-E. -E. Did you know about how long of a drive that is to, to Beaumont? It's about 400 miles. So your, your testimony by Zoom is necessary because of your health, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So let's talk about your... Your qualifications as a you, you said you're a, an MD. Where did you go to medical school? I went to uh, San Antonio uh, Medical School, University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. Okay, and when was that? 
1975. And after that, were you a medical physician after graduating medical school? Yes. And how long were you a physician? I've been a physician ever since. Okay. So let's talk about your qualifications as a forensic pathologist. What training and background do you have to testify as a forensic pathologist? Okay, I started my training uh, in the uh, Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office. That's Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, I started about 1982, I think, 83, and was there for um, uh, 10, 11 years before I came to Beaumont. Okay. Um, and during that time, I uh, learned the, uh, the depth of training that's necessary in uh, forensic pathology and uh, uh, took the forensic pathology specialty board examinations and, uh, and passed and have been certified as a forensic pathologist. How long have you been certified as a forensic pathologist? Since 1992. Okay. So, have you, since then, have you, have you practiced as a forensic pathologist since 92? Yes, I have. Where at? Well, uh, at Fort Worth, I went to Beaumont. And then after Beaumont, I went to Lubbock. And after Lubbock, I went to Phoenix. And then I came back to uh, Galveston and was uh, chief medical examiner for Galveston County for uh, a few years. And then my uh, health situation, uh, namely my osteoarthritis, uh, affects most of the joints in my body. And I... Uh, I um, retired a year early from uh, Galveston, and uh, we activated a disability uh, policy for me, and that kept me going for another five years. So back on January 14th, 1995, well, let's ask you this. Have you, have you performed few or many autopsies over the years? I have done many autopsies. Okay. Have you testified in court as a forensic pathologist? On many occasions, yes. And that's in the state of Texas? Uh, in the state of Texas. Where um, else? I've, I've been outside of Texas as a consultant and uh, testified in, uh, hmm, I'm trying to think, I think Florida and uh, Oh, goodness. Uh, I can't really remember other places that have okay. outside of Texas. But you have testified in court many times as an expert. I certainly have, yes. Okay, let's talk about January 14, 1995. Were you a forensic pathologist in Beaumont, Texas? I was. And how long had you been in Beaumont at that time for, from 95? How long had I been in Beaumont? Yes, sir. Say less than a year, I think. Um, it was that was early part of my uh, my stay in Beaumont. Okay. So, on January fourteenth, nineteen ninety five, did you perform an autopsy on a person by the name of Mary Catherine Edwards? I did. And. Were you requested to do so uh, by a justice of the peace? I was. I uh, functioned in Beaumont as a forensic pathology consultant uh, because that section of Texas was under the jurisdiction of the justices of the peace. So back then, the justices of the peace were the ones that pretty much declared the, the, the cause of death. Is that correct? Not the cause, but the manner of death. Okay. The matter of death is, is interesting. I uh, had talked with uh, a couple of the justices of the peace who were objecting to my uh, rendering an opinion as to the matter of death, and I had told them if they didn't want 
me to write an opinion about the manner of death on my reports, then they really didn't need a forensic autopsy. They can get an autopsy done by a, uh, a pathologist in the hospital. Uh, but if they want a forensic autopsy, they need to accept my opinion about the manner of death. And my report uh, in this case has that opinion in parenthesis. Uh, the manner of death was determined by the justice of the peace and then uh, for instance homicide was my opinion uh, at the time that I did the autopsy well let's, let's talk about that autopsy um, who was present at that autopsy Boyd Lamb from the police department in Beaumont and when you started that do you remember about when you started that autopsy I started at 6 o'clock in the evening and ended at midnight. And have you had a chance to look at some photographs that I've provided for you? Yes, I have. Okay. Let me... Have you looked at State's Exhibits 4 through, yes. 20, through 29? Yes, I have. Okay. And do those fairly and accurately depict the autopsy that, of the person that you performed the autopsy and the photos of the person on the autopsy that you performed the autopsy on that, that on January 14th, 1995? I believe they do. Yes, sir. The judge of uh, eight has already been tendered, so I've already shown the counsel. We'll be on four through 29, but it's four through seven and then five through 29. So the photos are Objection four through seven and nine through twenty nine. And nine through twenty nine. And that's because number eight was introduced yesterday. They were admitted. Just permission to post it just to the jury. We can have a moment. Doctor, we're going to give the jury just a moment to look at these, okay? And then we'll talk about your autopsy.
Doctor, now that the jury's had a chance to look at those, let's talk about the autopsy. Um, did you prepare an autopsy report as part of that autopsy? The condition of the body when it arrived and what you did for, on each part of the autopsy? Yes. And did you also document each and every little uh, injury that you could find on the body? I did. And did you make a... a Cause of death and manner of death, or your opinion in that autopsy. I did. And I've shown you, uh, we've given you a copy of State's Exhibit 1, have we not? It's the autopsy report? Yes, I have it in my hand. And is that an accurate copy of, of what you prepared for that autopsy? Yes, there it is. Take uh, State's Exhibit 1, Kendrick. Huh? No objection, State's 1, Kendrick. Without objection, states exhibit one is admitted. So, doctor, let's kind of talk about the autopsy. Um, when you perform an autopsy on an individual, what is the process that you go through? Um, in rough approximation, you start with an external examination. You describe the things that are on the body and. Uh, and then the exterior appearance of the skin surface of the body. Following that, you make an incision and open up the body cavities and examine the uh, uh, the organs and uh, describe them in terms of weight from anything that's uh, uh, out of normal expectations. Uh, during that process, you. Uh, can take small sections of various organ tissues and, and send them off and receive them in uh, a few days for microscopic examination. And I did that in this case. And uh, so I looked at the, uh, the appearance of the organs as they appear under the microscope. Um, also, uh, in this particular case, uh, after I had uh, uh, first received the body and, and we took the clothes off, uh, I did a sexual assault uh, examination, took swabs from the vaginal vault, from the uh, anal vault, and from the oral cavity. Uh, those swabs were also uh, smeared out on glass slides for examination. Um, and uh, uh, tubes of blood were collected from the uh, uh, autopsy uh, victim here and uh, submitted along with the sexual assault uh, material that was turned over to uh, uh, Boyd Lamb and, uh, and the police department and it uh, started its journey towards wherever it was going to be further examined. So let's talk about the external examination of Mary Catherine Edwards. How did she arrive at the, for the autopsy? Okay. She was received in the body bag Hands were protected with paper bags, an identification tag on the right ankle stating the name and date, and uh, there was a short sleeve white sleeping shirt with a printed pattern 
on her, and then uh, a blue and black striped towel uh, placed over the abdomen. Okay. Let's talk about that T-shirt. Yes, sir. You, you described it. There's also a picture of her in your, in your autopsy photos, is there not? Yes, there is. Let me show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 37. Let's see if we can do this. 37. You don't have those, Doctor. It's going to be here. Oh. Your, your picture you're going to look at that, that will reflect... Will be 27 would probably be your best bet to look at. Yes, sir. Now you cut it off of her, did you not? Is that what you did? I didn't. I didn't understand. Did you Did you cut the T-shirt off? Did you cut it to get it off of her? Yes, we did. Okay. Can you see this T-shirt in your in your camera? I certainly can. And is this T-shirt in States Exhibit 37, is that the T-shirt you took off of Mary Catherine Edwards? It is. Okay. Tender States 37, Judge. No objection. States 37. 37 is admitted without objection. Now, she did not have on any underclothing underneath this t-shirt, did she? She did not. She was also draped in a towel. Am I correct? That yes. It came with the body. And as you describe that towel as a blue and black striped towel over the abdomen. Is that correct? Blue and black striped towel, yes. And looking at States Exhibit 27 that we provided for you, the photograph, do you see that blue and black towel there? Yes, I do. And when it was collected, I'm going to show you what's marked as States Exhibit 38A. And inside is States Exhibit 38. Let me show you States Exhibit 38. Do you... Recognize this towel? Yes. Is that the towel that's draped across Mary Catherine Edwards? That's correct. Tender stakes 38 and 38A. stakes 38, 38A. They were admitted. Now, were they, do you remember whether they were wet or whether they were dry? Did you know that? They were, I think they were damp. They were damp but not soaking wet? And that's my impression okay. or recollection. Okay. So after you removed the t-shirt, the towel, then you started the external examination looking at whether or not she had any injuries. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, let's kind of go over the, the injuries that you found of the blunt force trauma on Mary Catherine Edwards. Now, let's describe to the jury first, what is blunt force trauma? Okay, blunt force trauma is a, a category of injury that's used to describe abrasions which are caused by a scraping or impact injury to the skin, um, uh, contusions or bruises on the skin, and uh, um, sharp force injuries that uh, can be present on the skin and cause uh, separation of the uh, skin areas. Uh, that really is a sharp force trauma, but the blunt force trauma is uh, uh, abrasions and bruises. Okay. So let's talk about the injuries that were noted on Mary Catherine Edwards. I believe you listed in your report there were 36 different things that you noted. Is that correct? That is correct. Let's start with number one. Let me see if I can get something up for the jury here. I don't know if we can, we're going to try. Doctor, 
I'm going to lose you for a minute because i got to show the jury these, this diagram, but we're, we're still going to talk, okay? Um, let's start with number one. What was the, the first thing that you noted in your report? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, he's not going to be able to do sound. We're going to do it the hard way. Let's switch it back. Hang on, doctor. We're getting you back. There we go. Talk about number one. What did you show on number one as an injury? Okay, uh, reading from the report, the posterior pinna of the right ear, there's a transverse one thirty second inch wide scratch abrasion. Uh, that's listed on diagram too. So look at your diagram. Is that this right here that's noted as injury number one? Yes, injury number one to the uh, uh, upper part of that right ear. Okay. And number two, what does it say? Okay. Uh, the inner edge of the posterior pendant of the right ear is a, a gliding abrasion created by superior forces uh, directed upward is one eighth by one sixteenth of an inch. Okay, and that's the second mark there on that right ear. Is that correct? Yes, yes, it is. It's it's pretty small. Okay. What about number three? Number three is over the uh, edge of the right chin. It's a faint purple contusion. Um, it's vertically oriented, uh, and it's one quarter by one eighth of an inch. Let's talk a little bit real quick about the difference between light purple, dark purple. What do those mean? Okay. Uh, bruises occur in a, uh, a time orientation. Old bruises are greenish yellow to brown and are healing. Fresh bruises are purple, and here I've described this as a faint purple, so it's not real prominent, but it's, it's still a fresh bruise. So this would have occurred at or near the time of her death, is that correct? That is my impression, yes. Okay. So let's, let's continue on. Number four. What are we showing on number injury number four? At the right base of the chin. We have a purple contusion, one half by two sixteenths of an inch. Uh, three sixteenths of an inch, I'm sorry. And that's reflected on the diagram we're showing the jury right now. Is that correct? That is, that is correct. Okay, let's talk about number five. Number five is uh, at the left base of the nose, two small circular abrasions, a sixteenth of an inch in diameter each. And that's in the diagram number five. Okay. Number six? Number six, at the mid-region of the lower left nares or the side of the nose, a, uh, a slightly curvilinear abrasion, three-sixteenths by one-sixteenth of an inch. Um, this is uh, suggested to me of uh, fingernail impression. Okay, and that's that's kind of right there where the the nostril, top of the nostril is. is that right on that outer nostril? Yes. Okay. So let's go to number seven. Number seven's up on the uh, left cheek. Uh, there's a slightly curvilinear abrasion, three sixteenths by one sixteenth of an inch, which is also compatible with a fingernail impression. Okay, number eight. That's a one eighth, uh, one sixteenth diameter abrasion. It's just uh, 
beyond number seven a little bit. Okay. Let's go to number nine. Number nine is the left base of the chin is a faint purple contusion. Okay. Uh, a, a, a bruise. Okay. Okay. Number 10, I mean number 11, sorry. Number, right, number 10, right, right, number 10, sorry, number 10. Okay, it's good number 10, that's in the uh, uh, left central chest region, there's a faint abrasion, uh, scraping of the skin, one half by three sixteenths inch. Um, it could also be produced by uh, an impact to the uh, chest at that point, which uh, compresses the outside of the skin with enough force to uh, cause this uh, abrasion. And the abrasion looks kind of brownish and granular. Okay, number 11. Number 11 at the anterior axillary line, that's the uh, armpit of the right shoulder. It's a superficial abrasion. An eighth of an inch. Okay. Talk about number 12. Number 12 is surrounding uh, number 11, uh, and it's a dark purple contusion, three eighths of an inch in diameter. Okay. So the impression at the center is likely caused by impact to the skin and has produced a bruise as well. Okay. Number 13. Number 13 is at the anterior right hip. There's a moderate purple contusion, and this one is larger, three by one and one quarter inch. Number 14. Okay, number 14 is in the central portion of that bruise, and it's a mild pattern of gliding abrasion with, uh, produced by upward directed forces is one by three eighths of an inch. So there's uh, uh, blunt force directed trauma that has produced both the uh, bruise and the abrasion at the center. Okay, number 15. Number 15, the anterior or uh, front part of the left hip, there is uh, a dark purple contusion that I described as variegated. That means that it has, uh, it, it's not a solid continuous color, but it has variations of intensity uh, in purple. And uh, it is two and three quarters by one and a half inches. Number 16. Number 16 is in the center part of that same bruise and it's a gliding abrasion again by upward directed forces. This is one half by one quarter inch. So there's a, uh, a trauma that has produced both of these injuries. Okay. Number 17. Number 17 at the left mid groin region there's a, an abrasion that's produced by uh, upward direct forces, three quarters by one half inch. And number 18? Number 18, let's see. Okay, number 18 is at the uh, right lower mid back region, and it's a Superficial abrasion, three quarters by one quarter inch. I think you're looking at 19. One up from that, number 18. Okay. I'm sorry, the uh, posterior shoulder region yes, uh, is a dark purple, uh, uh, slanted contusion, four by five eighths inch. That's a uh, a long one, yes. And then we just described 19. Yes, sir. We a little bit below it. Let's and go to number 20. Number 20 
at the right posterior mid buttocks region. There's a dark purple bruise, three quarters of an inch in diameter. 21. Number 21. Okay. Ah, uh, anterior right. Okay, front part of the right upper leg. There's an older healing contusion with brownish discoloration and yellow edges. It's one by three eighths of an inch. Anything particular about those yellow edges? Well, it's uh, it's all part of the same bruise, and like I said earlier, as a bruise uh, heals, it goes through different colors, and the yellow and brown coloration is part of an older uh, bruise. It, it it was not part of the uh, trauma that occurred at the time of her death. Okay, so that particular injury might have been an older one, is that right? That is correct. Okay. Let's go to 22. At the right lateral upper leg, uh, side of the uh, right leg is a faint purple confusion, two by three quarter inches. Uh, there it is, okay. I see it. So it's it's uh, it's on the side of the leg, but it's more frontward oriented, and it's uh, like I say, a faint purple contusion. Okay. Number twenty-four. Twenty-three. Twenty-four. Okay. Number twenty-four. Proximal right anterior tibial surface. Uh, okay, this is on the uh, upper middle portion of the front of the right leg. It has a faint purple contusion, one and three quarter by one quarter inch. By uh, one inch. One inch. And 25? Yeah. On the uh, upper surface of the uh, side of the right foot is a faint purple confusion, a quarter inch. And number 26. 26. Number 26. And Okay, in the upper part of the uh, left uh, upper leg, the thigh region, uh, in the front part, there's an older contusion with a faint green coloration. So that particular bruise did not occur at the time of the attack, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So let's go to 27. 27. On the back side of the uh, right lower leg. Uh, there's a dark purple contusion. That's, that's uh, definitely part of uh, something happened at the time of death. And it's two and a quarter inches in diameter. Okay, 28. On the Uh, let's see, this is the dorsal service of the right wrist. Um, you hold your hand out, um, let's see, like this. There's an upper surface that is called the dorsal surface and a palmar surface okay. on the other side. So uh, this is on the back side of the right wrist. There's a transverse moderate purple contusion Two and a half by one and one quarter inches. Now, one thing we didn't talk about, Doctor, those bruises, what, what was around those wrists whenever the body arrived at the autopsy? Okay, the body was uh, presented 
with uh, the hands bound behind the back with uh, handcuffs, and I described the uh, uh, the handcuff instruments and gave a serial number uh, that was there. Let's see. Um, I have it. Just a minute. Okay. Secured at the wrist and the back by a locked pair of Smith & Wesson handcuffs. They were tightly bound with the left keyhole uh, pointing outward and the right keyhole uh, pointing towards the back. The customer serial number C27407 and an inscription model number M-100. So you got the serial number off those handcuffs, is that correct? Yes, she did. Okay, looking at State's Exhibit 36 that we have, there's some handcuffs inside of this. Yes. We're going to try to show you, if we can, the handcuffs themselves out of the bag. You can look and see if you recognize those. I don't know if we're going to be able to get the serial number on this camera, we're going to try. Uh, that's a little closer. Okay. Uh, C27407. I can read that. Is that the same handcuffs that you took off of Mary Catherine Edwards? It has to be. Why is that? Well, those serial numbers are unique to the uh, uh, handcuffs. They don't make another set of handcuffs with that same serial number on So that serial number that we have in State's Exhibit 36 matches the serial number that you noted in your autopsy. Is that correct? Yes, it does. Okay. Two to six, 36, and 36A is a package report. Objection is 46 and 36A, Judge. And, and B. I'm sorry, Judge. And B. Okay. Two to that up. One of the numbers. Two to 36, 36A, and 36B. No objection, so I'll have to remove that. They are admitted. So, Doctor, this, this, uh, <coughs> Contusion on the dorsal surface of the right wrist, is that from the handcuffs? Yes, it is. Okay. Let's go to entry number 29. What is that? Okay. Number 29 is... Uh, a transverse scratch abrasion, five-eighths of an inch. Okay. So number 30... Number 30, again, uh, on the uh, right wrist, on the top side, uh, there is a non-vital impression mark from the handcuffs, two and one quarter by one quarter inch. So what do you mean it, by non-vital impression uh, mark? Okay, there wasn't any bruising that was associated with it. And uh, that is something that has occurred uh, post-mortem. So from the handcuffs just being on her while she was deceased, if they rested there, that would create that impression? That's correct. Okay. Let's go to number 31. Okay. 31 is on the palmer surface, the bottom part of the hand, okay? Yes, sir. Um, and it's the right wrist. It is dark purple contusion, uh, an inch and a half by one half inch. Thirty-two. And thirty-two is on the uh, Palmer surface of the hand, the bottom part of the hand, uh, and the thenar eminence is the uh, 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 it's the base of the thumb and it has a, uh, a distinct um, prominence right here. Okay. It's, it's called the thenar eminence and um, there's a faint purple contusion, one by one half inch at that location. Well, you, you moved down to 32. Look at, are we on 32? Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. you're right, you're correct. Go to 33. Number 33 goes to the left hand, okay? Yes. Um, it's on the bottom side, and it's near that uh, eminence from the uh, base of the thumb. It's a dark purple contusion with a linear centrally depressed area, one and one quarter by one and a half inch overall. Um, the central depression is uh, from the handcuffs. The bruise itself is from the handcuffs, but uh, the, the the central depression is a residual that uh, has hung on because the handcuffs were still on when she got to me. Okay, number thirty-four. Number thirty-four is on the. Uh, uh, upper part of the uh, left wrist uh, the, I said radial surface okay that's over by where the thumb is and there's a dark purple contusion one quarter of an, or three quarters of an inch in diameter okay number 35 on the uh, upper surface of the left wrist this is on the uh, little finger side of that wrist has a dark purple contusion, seven eighths of an inch in diameter. And finally, number 36. Okay, number 36 is on the uh, upper surface of the uh, uh, left lower wrist, a series of two non vital impressions. Two and three quarters by one quarter inch, and two and one half by one quarter inch. These are from the handcuffs and um, are post mortem injuries. Now, was there anything else externally on Mary, Mary Catherine Edwards' body and, and her physical condition when she arrived at the morgue that caught your eye when you saw her? Yeah. Oh, let's see. In particular, I'm talking about States Exhibits 27, probably 26. Let's see if we got 26 it. would be more like it. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, you're talking, you're... 27? 26 and 27, yes, sir. And... Okay, 26 and 27. Okay. So uh, anything, phys physically, huh? anything well, physically that stands out to you as far as determining her cause of death and what happened to her? Thank you. Okay, get this back in here. Okay, 26 and 27, you know, used to uh, show the shirt she was wearing, but uh, also. They uh, show the foam that is present on her nose and mouth. Uh, it, it's just kind of streaming out. Uh, and it actually is uh, present on both sides. And uh, that foam is what led me to initially conclude that she had drowned in the bathtub that was full of water at the scene. I went to the scene. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you. Did you go to the scene? Yes. And there was, there was about four inches of water in the tub. But, and you said initially that led you to believe what? That she had drowned. So what else led you to believe she had drowned? Anything else or just that? Um... Well, the phone, but, um, you know, here I am uh, several years later and a lot more experience. Well, and, um, we're going to talk about that, I, Doctor, but at the, at the scene and at the time, you believe that she had drowned. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, since then, have you had more experience as a forensic pathologist and dealt with more drownings and other, other types of death? Well, I've, I've dealt with a, a particular category of death that's called um, 
um, restraint asphyxia where um, the person is unable to breathe. Their chest is compressed and they, uh, uh, they just simply can't breathe. And the characteristics of that are uh, that pressure on the chest puts pressure on the uh, large vein in the upper chest that returns blood to the heart and um, that uh, produces a, uh, a backup of blood because the arterial circulation is still beating from the heart and it produces this upper body congestion uh, congestion is a pathological forensic pathology term it means that the blood is uh, engorged in the, uh, in the venous uh, part of the circulation and return. Now, the, the heart still continues to produce uh, blood pressure by beating because it has uh, blood that returns from the lower part of the body and uh, uh, enables it to uh, um, circulate blood pressure through the arteries. The arteries are too muscular and stiff to be compressed by that external pressure in the chest. So what you end up with is an upper body um, dark purplish coloration that is also accompanied by little breaks in uh, some of the small tiny veins uh, and capillaries and they uh, spread out little hemorrhages that are present and uh, uh, are called tardu spots. Uh, I want to refer to one of the photography exhibits um, Exhibit 9 yes, sir. shows these tardu spots that are present on the eyelids. Are you talking about the little, the little spots that look like little minor, minor hemorrhages? They are little tiny hemorrhages. Um, and uh, that's a part of the picture and, and see That photograph is the uh, one that I've got that shows that uh, congestion. Uh, I, uh, that exhibit nine is, is uh, <coughs> indicative of these, uh, these findings that uh, occur because the chest is compressed and the Sorry. person cannot breathe. Along with that, uh, the blood flow backs up in the brain and the brain starts to swell and that happened in this case and it compressed the lower part of her brain against the lower part of her skull and uh, that is what stopped her from finally trying to breathe um, it's called herniation and um, that was uh, the result of the asphyxial type of death. Um, 
Now, I've seen a number of these cases now. Uh, one particular that the uh, uh, fellow was caught in a grain silo and kept pouring the grain on top of him and he couldn't uh, get his chest to breathe and he had a, a similar appearance to this. So could that have been caused by someone being on top of another person and applying pressure to them from behind? Yes, it could. If it was done strongly enough and for a long uh, period of time? Yes, indeed. About how long would it take? Just an hour? I, I would say probably about between five and ten minutes. Okay. So also, let, let's talk about uh, the photographs, uh, the lividity that you see on the body. Was that what you would expect to see from someone who had been slumped over a bathtub and left there? Well, okay. Lividity is a, uh, a phenomenon in which the blood in the uh, vessels of the body uh, goes and migrates to the lowest point by uh, gravity. And uh, the, uh, as in the first four hours or so, that lividity you can press on the uh, purple color in the skin at the lowest point and it will blanch. But after about seven hours, it doesn't blanch anymore. It becomes fixed. And uh, so you can uh, estimate times of death um, from whether it's uh, blanchable or not. Um, that's the. I mean, look back here and under externals and things. Prominent anterior upper body fixed purple lethal mortis. The target spot on the anterior chest and face. Uh, that's interesting because the posterior surface of the body reveals a, a slight degree of blanchable uh, uh, lividity. And um, she was transported to the morgue on her back, yes. but she found at the scene. Uh, on her um, on her uh, stomach and face uh, over by the between the the, uh, the toilet and the uh, bathtub and uh, well, if, there was so evidence this, that, if there was evidence that when she was found by her parents that she was slumped over sideways over the bathtub with her head hanging down in the water would that be more consistent with that lividity up in the upper part of the body uh, yes, it would, but uh, it, it's also uh, indicative of the position in which she was found at the scene, too. Okay. When they turned her over on her back and transported her in the body bag to the morgue, uh, she started to develop some additional uh, lividity to her back, uh, which was just starting, and that... Uh, that's why I made that observation about the blanchable lividity on the posterior surface. It was fixed on the anterior surface, so that's pretty much how she died on her anterior surface. But uh, um, like I say, when we started transporting her on her back to the morgue, uh, some of that lividity was able to uh, migrate to the back surface and it still be, uh, and then it was more freshly formed. Let's talk about what did you determine the cause of death was. Now, uh, at the time, I, I determined that death was due to drowning because of the bathtub and the froth on her nose. Was there something else about the lungs that you looked at this time that also helped you determine that it was not drowning? That it was not drowning? Yeah, the lungs were. Uh, uh, 
341 and 374 grams, right and left. And um, I don't really think that that's quite enough to be indicative of uh, uh, a drowning. We're there is a there is a phenomenon that's called dry drowning in which the lungs would be light, but that's because of a spasm of the little flap at the top of your uh, breathing tube that just closes down and will not let any water come in. Uh, that usually happens in uh, deep water drownings. But in this case, you, you looked at the weight of the lungs and it didn't seem like it had enough fluid in it to, to constitute drowning. Is that correct? Along with other uh, things. Hey, yes, sir. That's it. In a, sort of a gray zone because they were, uh, they, they did exhibit some um, um, foamy cut surface. Let's see. Uh, is it possible that while while someone was trying to drown them, they asphyxiated them by holding them down and, and caused that type of death? Uh, yeah, by uh, uh, pressing on them so that she couldn't breathe, yes. Okay. So what was the ma manner of death? What was the cause of death in your opinion now, Judge? Uh, Dr. Stark? Okay. At the present time? Yes, sir. I, I would like to change that opinion to... Um, as uh, you know, uh, asphyxiation, entrapment, asphyxiation. Okay. Now you said, and, and what was the what was the manner of death, in your opinion? And the manner of death it was a homicide. And the uh, the bruising and everything that was on her, did it appear there was a struggle that occurred while she was uh, being subdued with those handcuffs? I would think that would be consistent. Yes. Okay. Just one second. Please, uh, all parties be mindful, not to interrupt you, but the jury is, these are terms that are being used that the jury yes. may not be familiar with when we take for granted because we do with this routinely. But if, uh, be sensitive about help the jury understand terms such as homicide. Yes, sir. What, doctor, what are we talking about homicide? Can you define okay. that jury? A homicide is a death that occurs at the hands of another through intention or negligence. Now you also, as part of your autopsy, performed a sexual assault exam. Is that correct? You did a rape kit, what we call rape kit. Yes, yes I did. Now those kits... They come in a white box, didn't they, back then? Yes, sir. And the white box had everything you needed to conduct that exam in it, didn't it? Well, it had glass slides in it and uh, a comb and uh, I don't know if it had clippers. We probably used the uh, scalpel, but we were submitting uh, samples of combed pubic hair and of uh, fur cut pubic hair, as well as swabs that uh, were taken from the vaginal and the anal and the oral uh, cavities, and these were also uh, slid across the glass sides and dried for uh, further examination, and all that was put in uh, to a sexual assault examination kit, and uh, uh, signed off by me. Uh, I turned that kid over to uh, Boyd Lamb. Okay. Now, when you when you do this sexual assault assault exam, um, there is a there's some chain of custody forms that go along with it with that you include with it. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Let's let's talk first. Let me show you uh, what's marked as State's Exhibit Thirty Two. Does that look like one of those sexual exhaust exam boxes? Can you tell? Okay. It's got, I have a, it's got a lot of stickers on it. I can, I can see what you're having is 32 and I got 
uh, a photograph of 32 in okay. her hand. Does that appear to be a sexual exhaust exam uh, box that you would get and use as a kit? Is that correct? Uh, okay, okay. You show it to me. You know, you turn it around a little bit so right, I can see. Way, it has, it has, it has volume. It has volume. It's thick or a and thickness. Okay, what, what I'm looking at here is the top surface, and I can't see that there's any depth to that uh, on my photograph, but I can see that on the uh, uh, Elmo there. What is on that, that tape right there that I'm showing the red tape on Stacey's 32 if I can get it up in front of there? What date is that? Can you tell? Uh, okay. Can you see it? Look at their camera. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. It looks like it's Let's say January 14th, 95? I see the 14 and 95 slash marks. The first part of that it is like it's a little blue. Can you tell? Let me see if I get a little yes. How's that? He didn't hear your question. Y'all were both talking. Did you ask him again about the number? Is that, what, what date does that show? Okay, I see 01 out of that. So that's January 14th, 95. That's when you performed the sexual assault exam, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So included in that sexual assault exam were a bunch of envelopes with numbers on them, weren't they? Well. There's steps that you have to take. Is that correct? Envelopes. I don't see. Let's see. I mean. Yeah. You, you may, you're, you're going to have, if you look at the one with the blood, Doctor, I'll show you just a minute. Let me get these out. Okay. Let me just show you stage 34. These envelopes like this. You remember these envelopes? Look at the camera, Doctor. Look at the, look at the screen. Okay. Do you remember yeah. these envelopes? In the sexual I've assault got, exam. I've got step seven uh, on yeah, the uh, but, copy. But, but they each, each step has an envelope, does it not? Um, to the best of my recollection, yes. Okay. I mean, this, this, these all have directions on how to do it, is that correct? Yeah, there was a, a direction. Uh, I'll walk the one with it. Okay. Well, let's talk about some of the things that you did in that sexual assault kit. Yes. Let's look at States Exhibit 33. I'm going to show you some boxes that are States Exhibit 33. I'm going to show you some boxes contained in them and see if you recognize States Exhibits 33A, B, and O. And I'm going to show you each one individually. This is States 33A. Do you see anything on there that, would, that would, you would recognize? Oh, yes, indeed. I see my handwriting. And what else do you see? Sharpie pen. Okay. And it's got the case number 95-011. That was my case number that I assigned to this. Um, and this particular one is the anal swab. Now, I notice you put Mary K. Edwards. It's really Mary C. Edwards, is it not? Uh... Okay, yes. Okay. Is that still the same autopsy number and that's your signature or your, your name written on that? Is that correct? That is correct. In is, my handwriting. Is that the swab that you took, the anal swab that you took from Mary Catherine Edwards? We'll show you the other side of the box to show you which swab it is. Show yes. The anal part. So is that the anal swab that was taken from Mary Catherine Edwards? 
Yes. Okay. And when you did that, did that swab, did you do the outside or inside of the anal cavity? When you I did the ins inside of the anal cavity. Okay. So let's look at States Exhibit 33B. Okay. Do you recognize that? I do. And what it's, does that have on it? It has the same markings as the uh, previous one. Does it have uh, case number, uh, victim's name, the date, and my name, and my handwriting? Okay. And so you wrote that on that box, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And this was taken on January 14th, 1995, like the other one was, right? That is correct. And was this a vaginal swab that was taken from Mary Catherine Edwards? Yes, it was. Okay. And we're going to show you 30, 34? <laughs> 33O. Correct. 33O, is that, do you recognize that? I do. And what is that, that that makes you recognize it? What's on there? Okay, there's the case number, the victim's name, uh, the date of the examination, and my name, and it's all written in my handwriting. Okay, and this was on January 14th, 1995, is that correct? That is correct. And is this the oral swab that you took from the victim, Mary Catherine Edwards? It is. And that was all part of the rape kit that you performed, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now let's look at States Exhibit 35. Exhibit 35 is going to be step number seven that you were looking at while ago. Is that uh, okay? I don't have the directions in front of me, so I, okay. We we'll just but step number seven. I see step number seven okay. on the envelopes. Did you take fingernail clippings from Mary Catherine Edwards as part of the sexual assault kit? Yes, I did. And scrapings. And, and those, uh, step number seven is that the right hand and left hand of Mary Catherine Edwards. It is. Okay. And each one of those will contain, if it was identified later on by laboratory, the fingernail clippings that came from Mary Catherine Edwards. Is that correct? That is correct. And those were included in, inside of the sexual assault exam kit. Is that right? Yes. And they were noted on your chain of custody that we're going to show you in just a minute. Is that correct? Okay, yes, sir. Okay. show you states to give 34, Judge? I'm um, Dr. Is that step eight of the sexual assault kit? It is. And what is it contained in states exhibit eight? Or 34 on step eight? I don't know. <laughs> Let's open it up and look at it. What does it say it is? Well, a blood sample. Okay, would well that be the blood sample taken from Mary Catherine Edwards on January 14th, 1995? That would be correct. Okay. And when you take those, what, what is noted? How many tubes are in States Exhibit 8? There right, should be two tubes. Let me put it on the uh, record. Step number 8, uh, States Exhibit 34. Okay. 
Exhibit 34. The one we're showing you. Showing you right now. Right. I'm with you. Is that the blood samples in there? What what should be inside of there? Okay, there should be a purple stopper tube and a yellow stopper tube. Okay. One of them has EDTA as an anticoagulant. That's the purple stop. And the yellow stopper has uh, uh, acid citrate dextrose as an anticoagulant in it. Um, and it's used for blood typing. Doctor, there's the yellow cap tube. Yes, indeed. Can you read? Can we get where you can read that? And what should it say on it? things that you had, those, those things that we just showed you, you provided those inside of the, the sexual assault exam kit and you handed those over to Boyd Lamb. Is that correct? That is correct. And Boyd Lamb, you don't know what he did with them after he took them from you, do you? No, they need to follow a chain of custody and be signed off at each place. But 
we provided you with copies of State's Exhibits 2 and 3 which are the chain of custodies. You remember, you have copies of those, is that correct? I do. The problem with the first one for the sexual assault kit. Yes, sir. I don't have the reverse side of that, but that uh, would indicate that it was signed over to Boyd Lamb. So if you look at State's Exhibit 2 on the back side, Okay, you're gonna have to show. There you go. You can see my signature yes, and uh, Boyd's signature. Yes, sir. Um, uh, that's where transferred custody. It should be a date on there, and that's what we're talking. Okay. So if it says January 14th, 1995, that was when the autopsy was occurred. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Okay. States Exhibit Three. Which chain of custody is States Exhibit Three? Okay. Let's see what we got. Okay. Uh, trace evidence recovered from the body and clothing. What do you mean by trace evidence? Okay, trace evidence is uh, uh, material that is collected from the body. Um, you know, crime scene technicians can collect it at the scene as well, but. Uh, what I do is, you know, look at what we have on the body. And we have hairs, fibers, um, a tiny silver reflected material, hairs, hairs, uh, that are described by color. Um, there's a paint chip from the uh, right groin, a white flag uh, loose, a white flake loose in the body bag, and then we have the handcuffs, uh, the t-shirt, and the uh, blue and black bath top. Okay, so that's what those are described at. So are these, are these accurate copies of the chain of custody that you signed over to Boyd Lamb on January 14th, 1995? Okay, yes they are. Okay. Tender states two and three. Uh, those yeah. No objection to the documentation, Judge. Two and three. Are you moving of those into evidence? Yes, sir. Without objection, states exhibits two and three are admitted. Now, doctor, those chains of custody, what are those for? Those are to demonstrate who has possession of this evidence as it gets transmitted up the chain to various uh, people that will examine the contents that are contained with, uh, with the chain of custody form. So when you took all the exhibits of the, the fingernail clippings, the blood tubes, the uh, swabs that were taken from the body, all those were placed inside of the kit in States Exhibit 32 and given to Boyd Lamb. Is that correct? That is correct. And after that, you had no further dealings with those. Is that right? Uh, that is correct. I would like to have reports back, but that doesn't happen. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your for your testimony. I'm going to turn you over to the defense attorney now for cross examination. Hold on. Oh, yes, uh, just some housekeeping. What the state's exhibits are being tended to fit in this? this I, I'm not admitting some of these until just the ones I admitted. We've got some more people there if you want to change for the others. All right. State's exhibit 34 has not been admitted. Yet. No, sir. State's exhibits two and three have been admitted. Yes, sir. States exhibits 36, 36A, and 36B have been admitted. Uh, yes, sir. I believe that was that the in case, yes, sir. Those have been admitted. And the towel, which was 38 and 38A. Yes, sir. And also the t-shirt with the 37 yes, exhibit 37 yes, admitted. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. In states exhibit one. The autopsy report is in there. I don't have that. 
You're welcome, Your Honor. Thank you for letting me be here. Yes,
additional questions. That's correct, Your Honor. You are allowed. Doctor, I neglected to talk to you about a couple of issues. Um, what was the reason for you doing the sexual assault exam? Um, the scene would indicate that there has been sexual uh, uh, assault, and you need to prove it by doing the, uh, uh, the swabs. But, um, you know, at the time of the autopsy examination, the uh, anus was uh, rather large, and uh, it, it relaxes after death, but um, if you get positive swabs back that show that there's semen, then you can say that the, the disease has been sodomized. Okay, so let, let's talk about what you just said about the, the anus. Let's, let's first let's talk about vaginal. Looking in, in your experience, if there was semen found inside the, the vaginal area, the vagina, if there was semen found inside the body there, and looking at the number of numerous injuries and the handcuffing, in your opinion, would uh, was it possible that a sexual assault occurred? Yes. And and you talked about and that would be vaginally when you're looking at uh, States Exhibit 22. I believe that's the the injury that uh, that you're talking about, the bodily part that was a gate, I guess we can call it. The anus, is that correct? That's that's an anus, view of the anus, yes. Okay. What stands out to you, and I'm going to show the jury that picture, what stands out to you in that photograph that causes you to think that might have occurred? Well, the anus is uh, enlarged and uh, gaping open. And um, as I say, it's possible that that can occur just naturally after death. But if the uh, anal swab comes back and shows the presence of semen, then you know that the uh, deceased has been sodomized. Okay, so in your opinion, if it comes back with semen detected in there, then the, the victim had been sodomized? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. And if it comes back with semen in both the, the vagina and the anal cavity, would that be consistent with sexual assault of the victim? It would indeed. Okay, thank you. You passed away? Yes, sir. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. It's been a long time. I have some questions for you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. I can hear you. We're going to get back to the last questions in a little bit, but I've got some questions um, that I want to start with. When you first started your testimony, you talked about a conflict between you and the Justice of the Peace at the time. Remember talking about that? Well... Yes. Okay, well you talked about cause of death and men or death and you could just have somebody at the hospital do the autopsy versus a forensic pathologist like yourself. You remember testifying to that with the state's questions? I do. Okay, can you tell me why? Why what? Why did you have a conflict or why was there, why was there a disagreement? Because the justices of the peace had felt that the uh, uh, manner of death really was uh, their purview alone. And uh, I had uh, a difference of opinion about that because of my background and training, which was nowhere near what the justices of the peace had. Well, she determined that uh, it was a homicide. Yes, yeah, she did. Did you disagree with that? No. Nope. Was it just that you wanted to render the, the opinion mm -hmm. and not her, or...? I wanted my report to reflect the opinion of a forensic pathologist as to the manner of death. The 
cause of death that you said back in 1995 was drowning. That's correct. And now you've changed your opinion. I have. When did you change your opinion on that? Uh, when I was reviewing this case, uh, you know, a month ago. So almost 30 years after reviewing the case, did you, after you reviewed oh. that, you changed your mind almost 30 years ago, well, from 30 years ago. Yes, sir. You did test, though, that, that, that day in reference to taking samples and looking at uh, items. What made you believe that it was a drowning uh, at that time in 1995? There was uh, a bathtub that had water in it, and she was wet, and um, there was foam coming from the nose and mouth. Did you ever dissect the lungs to see if there were fluid in there? I did. And? Um, small amounts of fluid were present, but, uh, uh, you know, in review, I don't think it was sufficient to uh, uh, continue with the opinion of drowning. But that review was about 30 days ago. Approximately, yeah. You talked about asphyxiation now is your opinion in reference to possible cause of death. Correct? Correct. How much pressure does someone have to exert in order to stop someone from breathing? I imagine that's going to depend on the ability of the uh, victim to expand their lungs and uh, chest and diaphragm. Um, this was a small female, and so certainly not the same as a, a male power lifter. Well, so you don't have any idea what, what kind of force or uh, that would be needed in order to stop someone from breathing, exerting pressure on the chest. And I wouldn't say that. Okay. Well, then, doctor, what kind of pressure then would be needed? Uh, pressure sufficient to stop her from breathing. But you didn't determine that. I didn't determine that. No. When you when you when you testified in reference to now the way you think caused or way or manner or means the death was caused you noted a lot of bruising uh, and uh, in your autopsy wouldn't that have caused more bruising across the chest if it was compressed to such a point that the person couldn't breathe if there was something that was small enough to uh, uh, cause a bruise uh, you know, bruising occurs because of uh, an impact on the skin that has uh, broken the blood vessels beneath it. But uh, if the chest is being pressed against the bathtub, uh, that's a broad enough surface that it might not cause any uh, visible bruising. When you say might not, but it could. Well, let's say that it didn't in this case. So there was no indication of any bruising at all from the compression? I, I'm sorry, I missed what you said earlier. Yeah. So are you, are you telling the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that there is no bruising or there isn't any indication of bruising based on your now assumption that asphyxiation caused the death? Well, we have bruising that's on the body that is there from uh, um, trauma at the scene. The most notable of which would be uh, in the diagram 
from the autopsy report. Um, I'm looking at the uh, full body diagram and um, there's bruising at the uh, anterior portion of uh, each hip. That is likely to be caused by uh, the pressure or let's say it's consistent with uh, being caused by uh, pressure from the uh, edge of the bathtub. Um, but the, uh, you know, that is pressure that's exerted over the hip area and, you know, in order to be an asphyxiation, you have to be able to uh, uh, render the victim unable to breathe in the uh, chest region. And, uh, you know, the uh, evidence right now is pointing to the fact that she suffered an asphyxial death from uh, a form of entrapment asphyxia and uh, the petechia around the eyes, on the surface of the eyeballs, on the tip of the epiglottis, which is the little flap at the top of the uh, breathing tube, um, and um, the face and uh, upper body, all those indicate that she was unable to breathe and had uh, uh, a severe restriction of the blood return from the uh, superior vena cava or the upper vein that drains the head, neck, and upper body. That's the second time you talked about the upper vein and the restriction on that. Correct? The second time? The second, I mean, I, I testified as such right. for the prosecution. Right, the second time. Are you are you telling the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that the marks around her mid-waist caused her to stop breathing through her lungs? No, I'm not. Are you saying that the force or the bruise, which is uh, number 10 that you testified to, which was one half inch by three sixteenths inch bruising uh, in the chest, right in the middle? Are you oh, saying the chest. Oh, right, that little mark right there. Are you saying yes, that caused her from stop breathing? No, sir. How about the ones on her right arm, which would be number 11 and number 12, which is a uh, the, the bruising, the three eighths inch and one eighth inch. Are you saying? Those, that, yeah, that's uh, number eleven and number tw uh, twelve. Are yes, you, sir. Are you saying those caused it? No, sir. And there's really no other marks except around the back. Uh, there was uh, some type of mark on her. I believe it was her right shoulder on the back. And that would have been number uh, 18? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, that wouldn't have caused it, would it? I don't think so. I think that's reflective of uh, trauma to the shoulder itself. It's did, a dark purple bruise. Did you see anywhere where her, her air, air passage was restricted around her neck? Straight no, I did not. Did you notice any bruising around the mouth that, uh, in reference to anything that says that something was stuffed in her mouth or a hand was put over her mouth in such a force that would cause any bruising? Well, I didn't see any bruising that would uh, indicate that. It doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Are you saying it happened? I'm not saying it happened. You talked a lot about, and there's 36 uh, uh, observations that you did in reference to bruising. Remember talking about that, Doctor? Okay. Can you repeat that question? Sure. Now? Absolutely. 
you talked about 36 incidents or, or, or observations that you made on Miss Edwards' uh, torso or body uh, in reference to bruising. You remember testifying to all those? Bruising and abrasions, yes. Is there a way for you to tell specifically or somewhere around the time that those bruisings occurred? Well, the ones that were dark purple or of purple coloration are though uh, they are occurring around the time that she was being uh, assaulted. And, how but, you, uh, and what do you base that on, Doctor? I base that on the appearance and color of the bruises and abrasions. There were some that were older. But can you give a time frame? Uh, there's there's been testimony that it could have happened the night before, uh, somewhere after midnight. Uh, could it have been that short, or could it have been longer? Or there's really no way to actually tell. I am definitely of the opinion that these bruises and abrasions that are described uh, with fresh characteristics occurred around the time of her death. On the top of that list where you noted the bruising, you put blunt force trauma. Remember your report? I do. Do you know how much force has to be used in order to be classified as blunt force? Whatever force is able to produce the findings of bruising or scraping of the skin or impact injury to the skin. So if I, if I, if I knock into uh, the corner of the coffee table and I get a bruise, that's brute for, uh, blunt force? Yes, it is. What is not blunt force that court causes bruising? A, a bruising is a type of blunt force trauma. Okay. To whatever to whatever degree is necessary to cause the bruising. It's a manifestation of the uh, blunt force trauma. Are you saying that any force that causes bruising would be considered blunt force? Yes, I am. Okay. You testified that these injuries or bruising and scrapings uh, or abrasions that were probably done in a struggle. Do you stand by that? Yes. And you went to the scene. I did. How, how long after this happened were you called to the scene? Hmm. Was it that day? Was, it, excuse, was Miss Edwards still there at the scene? Who? Uh, the victim. Was yes. She, she's still in the bedroom? I mean, the bathroom? She was in the bathroom, okay. laying on, on the uh, uh, floor between the, uh, the, the toilet and the bathtub. Did you take a look around to see where the possible struggle might have been? Or occurred? Uh... You know, I would say I believe I did, but of course I haven't recorded it. Okay. Where, where do you believe you might have seen it? I have seen what? The uh, struggle. bathroom? Struggle. Okay. I don't know. That. <clears throat> uh, I don't have any recollections to whether I saw evidence of a struggle or not. Uh, I was really relying upon the report from the Justice of the Peace uh, of the condition of the scene at that time. Do you have a written report from the Justice of the Peace? I usually do, yes. Do you 
remember looking at one. I know it's been 30 years ago. Uh, no, I don't have a specific recollection of that report. And it is apparently not available at the present time. My report, uh, second paragraph of my report on page two, says that the biographical details concerning the demise of the deceased are set forth in the supplemental report from the Justice of the Peace. I have not seen that document recently. So if it was in your second on your second page, there was a supplemental report somewhere that you relied upon? At the time of the autopsy, there was, uh, yes, having visited the place personally and talked with the Justice of the Peace um, and getting the information from her report to me, but uh, again, we have to rely on my memory, which is uh, not specific in that regard. Right. And I, I do remember going to the scene. Okay. And I, I just to, to, to just to clarify, and I'm going to move on, uh, Doctor. Is somewhere on page two of your report that was entered in as state's exhibit number one. Uh, you also referenced the supplement the supplemental report. Is that what you're testified to? Yes, I am. You said and you testified to a number of things that you did during the autopsy. And you would agree with me that your job is, one, is to look at the body uh, to see any deformities or anything that basically sticks out uh, that's not normal. Correct? Like the bruising or if something was broken or a gunshot wound, it's not in this case, but things like that, correct? That's correct. And then you go in and you actually go section by section to determine what may cause the bruising or what the condition of a person is uh, when they're being examined. Correct? Um. I'm trying to put it in simple terms. I know. And... Um you examine uh, each part of the body, doctor, don't you? Try to. Well, I, I do an external examination. That's where all the bruising is, is right. involved. Yep. And in some cases, I have been presented with an object that may have caused the bruising and asked if it was consistent. And I have said yes or no to that. None of that occurred in this case. When you do the autopsy, you wear gloves, right, to, pr to protect not only yourself, but to protect any evidence from contamination? That's correct. During that time, you testified that you took swabs from, from body cavities, correct? That's correct. Okay. You also uh, combed certain areas of the body, uh, pubic hair areas, correct? Yeah, I... In, in doing a sexual assault, it, you swab each of the body cavities, the anal, oral, and uh, vaginal vaults. You uh, do pubic hair combings to try to uh, catch any foreign hairs that may be present. You do pubic hair clippings so that there is comparison of the victim's hair with those uh, combings. And you take uh, each of the swabs is smeared on a slide, so you have slides that are prepared and dry, and then the blood specimens are collected, uh, and that pretty much uh, uh, summarizes the sexual assault kit. Right. But in this, what you did was you 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 pulled and combed the hair, the pubic hair, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, you combed the head hair. No, I did not. Well, if 
it says in item number 10 on uh, state's exhibit number two, do you have that? Item number 10. Yeah, state's exhibit mm -hmm. number two, which is the chain of custody form. Okay. And Hold on. item number 10. Okay, I'm looking at this. Okay, it says one envelope, combed head hair. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, um, that's not something that I normally do, but if it's in the, uh, uh, the sexual assault kit uh, and requested, of course it will be done. One question, Doctor, is if you don't normally do it, did someone request you to do that? And apparently the sexual assault uh, kit requested that. Okay. And do you know why they asked you to do that? Um, no, I don't. Okay. You also pulled hair uh, from different parts of uh, the head area. <clears throat> That's number 11. That's correct. Okay, and then you also did the fingernail clippings on the right and left hand. Were those, were those all fingers, or were they just certain fingers, or were they all five on each hand? No, it's, it's all five digits on each hand. If you go to exhibit number three, state's exhibit number three. I got you. You took a lot of stuff or co uh, collected a lot of items from state's exhibit number three. That's correct. Uh, black hair from the shoulder of the shirt. And item number one, yes. Reddish hair and dark fiber from inside the neck of the shirt. Reddish hair. That's item number two. Uh, green fiber and, and, and small reddish fiber from uh, the side of the shirt. And side is three. Hairs from the right side of the shirt. You didn't, you, and that's number four. You didn't say whether or not they were dark or they were red or blonde. Is there a reason why? Uh, no, I don't have any reason for that. Um, and it may have been that I was not able to tell the color. Okay. And you took some from the inside or lower front of the shirt, which is the next item. So an awful lot of hair you've been, you were collecting. Yes, sir. But number six, you said dark hairs from the lower front of the shirt, uh, hair from the back of the shirt, uh, which is number seven. Correct. Number eight is tiny silver reflective material. What was that? Tiny silver reflective material. I can't tell you any more than what that is described there. But you uh, you put it up, or, or excuse me, you confiscated it, packaged it up, and gave it to uh, Mr. Boyd Lamb, the police officer. Uh, I, I did. Uh, these okay. items were evidence, so they were not uh, part of the sexual assault kit. Uh, and, and trace evidence was examined in a separate laboratory. Okay. You received or you confiscated hair from the right, right side of the face and light colored hairs from the right breast. Light colored hair. Yes, that's time as well. Okay. And then reddish hair again from the left breast. And that's item 13. Right. You see that? Yes. And that was all collected and packaged and given to the Beaumont Police Department, uh, Mr. Lamb, that was at the autopsy, correct? Yes, sir. There's also items 14 through 19. Hair on the uh, right leg? Yes. A white paint chip? Yes. And white flake in the body bag? 
That's correct. And then also you have the handcuffs. The handcuffs and the t-shirt and the towel. This happened in 1995, correct? That is correct. Was DNA at that time kind of in its infancy, uh, just starting up? Pretty much so. Uh, I first became uh, acquainted with DNA uh, when I was in the Fort Worth office, and uh, I was there for 10 years, I guess. Uh, what year was that, Doctor? Okay, uh, I was certified in forensic pathology in 1992, uh, taking a, uh, a long, comprehensive examination that covered uh, not only just forensic pathology, but uh, uh, asking for a level of expertise in toxicology and microbiology and biochemistry and um, uh, some trace evidence uh, material and how it was examined um, and um, DNA uh, as I recall was starting to be recognized and we were setting up a laboratory in the Fort Worth office and uh, the uh, Fort Worth Police Department was also setting up a DNA laboratory and the uh, premier expert in DNA was a guy named uh, Arthur Eisenberg and he was on the faculty at uh, uh, North Texas uh, State University at that time and set up uh, a laboratory also in Fort Worth for the purpose of um, examining DNA from uh, uh, and comparing it to, uh, it was to prove primarily paternity suits and there was a central laboratory that was set up. Uh, Arthur, let's see, he was also on the faculty at uh, Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine and um, did a great deal of his work in that laboratory at uh, uh, Fort Worth. Doctor, I, I guess the point of my question is, back then, you used, or, or law enforcement or, or scientists used hair samples and things like that to try to identify uh, suspects or, or individuals, correct? Uh, yes, sir. As far as hair, hair characteristics go, that is the case. Um, the DNA that's present in a hair fiber is uh, derived from uh, a person's mother's uh, um, mitochondrial DNA. And um, you took the it is, I'm sorry, doctor. Uh, okay, it took, does not match up with the uh, uh, DNA from the uh, um, whole body of a person. Uh, that DNA is derived from uh, the cellular nuclei. When you testified that it appeared to be the struggle because of the bruising, the abrasions. Right, a struggle happened. Is that the reason why you took the nail clippings uh, for, for testing? Actually, I take nail clippings on every uh, uh, case that I do, um, and uh, particularly in suspected homicides. And why do you do that? So that you can examine the material that's uh, uh, collected under the fingernails and uh, see if you can match it to something that's uh, part of a, the trace evidence uh, uh, examination. How would something get underneath the fingernails? Uh, by scraping and uh, uh, scratching. Like fighting? Because like fighting. Like fighting, yes. You mentioned fine. some uh, scar or, or scraping on her uh, Miss Edwards' front of her face. Uh, similar to that, 
when someone's fighting, clawing? Well, okay, I pointed out earlier that there were a couple of abrasions that I felt were consistent with fingernails uh, impression. Now, uh, there may not have been any uh, successful uh, getting of the, uh, the skin of the face, but uh, again, there might have been. The mark that's left behind is consistent with uh, a fingernail injury. Would you agree with me that if there's substance or something underneath the fingernails, there has to be some movement in order to scrape whatever you're touching to break off and get underneath the fingernails to be deposited. Would you agree with me on that? Okay, you're asking if the arms are not restrained so that uh, um, she can uh, impact the, uh, the uh, assailant. Right. But it, and I'd say yes. I, I mean, yeah, my question though... She was out of handcuffs on her back. I understand. Yeah. Well, we're going I'm to get sorry. to that. We're going to get that in a second. But would you agree with me? In order for someone to have substance or something underneath their fingernails, they would have to touch or scrape something in order to deposit it there. That's correct. You just don't walk around and something comes underneath your fingernails. You have to scrape it, like in a struggle. Uh, yes, and then you have to consider what my fingernails look like right now. <laughs> I've got, got dirt under them. Well, I'll, I'd show you mine, but I'm in, a, in court too, Judge. I mean, uh, Doctor. Sorry, Judge. <laughs> um, so you took those samples in order as part of your protocol in doing an autopsy so that they can be evaluated to see if something was underneath there that could benefit whoever. Yes. Okay. When you removed the handcuffs and she was handcuffed behind her back, that's Ms. Edwards, were you using gloves? Yes. And was that to try to preserve any type of evidence that might have been on the handcuffs? Correct. You testified that, and I wrote it down, that each handcuff, or this handcuff, had a unique number to it. Correct? Yes. And matter of fact, you said what the number was. And that was unique to that individual pair of hair and handcuffs. And to the best of my knowledge, yes. Okay. Why would that be important to you uh, that there was a unique number or serial number on those handcuffs? Could they have traced where the handcuffs had come from? They might have been able to do that. I mean, and would you agree with me that things that have a serial number or a number usually or for a later date to try to find out either origin or where they might have been uh, through the recordings of that number? Yes, sir. And is that why you testified is, is that this was a unique set of handcuffs uh, because of the serial number and the model? Yes, sir. Okay. I want to move on to the sexual assault kit that you did, okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> the swabs. How did you go about doing that? Uh, in the sense of you took a swab out, did you start from the inside or the edge, or did you go all the way inside and work out? Oh, yeah. You, you insert into the, the cavity that you're examining and then uh, expose uh, the swab to uh, the entire circumference of the cavity okay. and gather your uh, collection that way. Do you work 
do you, is it just inside, or when you when you when you when you insert it inside, do you do you start swabbing it and pulling it out, swabbing it to collect all the evidence in there? Well, I meant the circumferential around the edge of the inside of the cavity, and then the swab is removed. Okay, so it's just on the edge, the inside of the edge that that, that you uh, that you uh, swabbed. Um, it's a little deeper than just the edge. You know, that edge that you're looking at in the picture is uh, called the anal verge. And it goes deeper than that and into the uh, um, uh, distal or distant end of the, uh, of the rectum as well. So. And did you do the same thing on the vaginal cavity? Yes, I did. And did you did you did you do the whole area when you swallowed? Yeah. It? Do you remember? Yes. Okay. And you package those uh, to send them off for uh, examination, correct? Yes, sir. Blood. Why did you take blood and and put it in the sexual uh, assault kit? Um. Okay, the uh, the blood is used to uh, do typing, uh, obtain DNA, and uh, uh, I think that's about the extent of what they need is they need the blood type and, uh, and then the genetic pattern. So you have one tube for typing, that's the yellow tube, and one tube for uh, uh, extraction of DNA from uh, white cell nuclei, and that'll be the uh, purple stopper tube. You also took some a couple other tubes, red, gray. Uh, was that for toxicology? Yeah, I did those. And those are separate collections. Right. Uh, and did you take those to get analyzed for toxicology? They were sent off for toxicology. Did you get a report back? I don't have a report. Do you know if there was ever sent off to be examined? The choice to send the stuff off should be mine. And uh, It says in my report that they were submitted for toxicological screening study. Bear with me, doctor. I only have a couple more minutes, okay? That's okay. All right. You took a, you took the shirt, you took the towel, uh, and that was to be, I guess, you, you gave it to law enforcement for any testing that they might have wanted to do. That's correct. And, uh, and that was up to them to do whatever they needed to do with those items uh, once you collected it uh, during your autopsy, correct? Uh, yes, sir. Trace evidence is uh, at the discretion of the police department who uh, were transferred the materials. I want to finally talk about the last, the last questions or topics that uh, you discussed with the district attorney. And that has to do with the swabs and the semen uh, in the anal and vaginal area. You said that if semen was detected in the anal area or, or the anus, uh, that it would show that there was sodomy or sodomized. Remember testifying to that? I do. Are you telling the court that any time that someone has anal sex, they're being sexually assaulted? I don't think I can say that. No, you can't, can you? Um, just well, because... Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Is that a question or yeah, an well, argument? Uh, don't uh, know what statements of attorneys do not constitute uh, testimony. I think we talked about that. It's not this, the questions or the statements. It's the answers that are made under oath. The attorneys are not under oath. And... They're important because of the question and answer method we use in the United States in trials. So 
the answer is based upon the circumstances of the question to help the jury understand that the answer, because it's not the question that's evidence, nor a statement that's made. And the attorneys will, they make opening statements, they'll make final arguments, and none of that is evidence. It's to help you understand the theory of the case. But again, it's the testimony of the witnesses under oath and exhibits that are admitted into evidence which constitute the evidence for you to consider. And that's why all the attorneys do it. I'm kind of like the referee in the basketball game sometimes, and there was a statement that was made that didn't have anything to do with the question, and please disregard any statements that are made in that manner. But, of course, opening statements and final arguments are very important, as well as the question in giving you the understanding of the theory of the case of each side and also the context of where the answer is coming from and why the answer is made. Thank you. Proceed. Doctor, my last question was, and I think I heard you, but I'm not sure. You're not saying just because of semen either in the anal or vagina area that it was an attack or a crime. It could be there because they had sex, correct? Yes, sir. Yes. Now, you talked about the size of the anus in reference to the pictures that we saw in one of the photographs. I don't know what picture it was, and you talked about its size and its opening, right? Yes, sir. And you said that that could be naturally caused, being open like that. Didn't you testify to that? I was saying it's possible that that's just a reflection of the relaxation of the musculature that occurs after death. But if there is semen that is present and collected from that opening, then that would represent evidence of sodomy. Right. Someone having sex anally. Correct. So you possibly then look at other things in reference to your exam to see whether or not it was forcibly done or consensually done, right? The fact that she was handcuffed and dead pretty much rules out consensual. Well, you said there was a struggle. You said there was a lot of bruising, right? Yes, sir. And the handcuffs. You don't know when the handcuffs were put on. Was it before or after, right? You have no way of telling. I'm sorry, before or after? After death. I'm sorry. Before or after death. You don't know when they were placed on her wrist. I do not. Okay. But in your report, when you examined those areas, did you not, when you examined the vagina, and I'm on page five, third paragraph, last two lines, the reference to the vagina area revealed no evidence of trauma is identified. That's correct. Then you went on to the rectal. Rectal, is that another name for anus? It is. And you said intact is intact, exhibiting prominent congestion and no evidence of trauma. Yes. So there was no tearing, no bruising, because you were real good on the front and the rest of the body of noting all the bruises, 36 of them, correct? Yes, sir. But around there, there's no bruising, no tearing, is there? That's correct. No sign of trauma around there because you noted, no trauma noted. That is correct. That is correct. It's an important observation. 
Well, that's through your examination, right? What about my examination? Yeah, that's your report. You reported that from your examination. Yes. yes. Okay. Doctor, did you understand all my questions? Yes, sir. Did you did you answer them to the best of your ability? I did. And is there anything you want to change or modify that said, oh, maybe I, I misspoke or I didn't quite understand it? I don't think so. Thank you for your time, doctor. I appreciate it. Pass the witness subject to recall. Thank you, Gaston. Doctor, just to clarify a couple of issues. The swabs. Each time you did a swab, you inserted it into the cavity. In other words, into the vagina. Is that correct? That's correct. You'd swab it around inside the vagina. Is that correct? That is correct. And you would take that, that swab out of the vagina. You're not swabbing just the area. You're swabbing the inside of the vagina. Is that correct? All the way around. 360 degrees around. Inside. It's a fifth structure. Is it inside the vagina? Inside the vagina. Okay. Then you take it out. What do you do with that swab whenever you take it out? You put it in the box. Put it in the box separately from everything else. Is that correct? That's correct. And then you start the next swab. Is that correct? That is correct. And the next swab would come through the, you did the anal swab that was inside the anal area. Is that correct? Inside the anus. Yes. In exactly the same manner. And you would take the structure 360 degrees all the way around the, uh, the surface of the inside. Take it out and put it in the box, is that correct? Yes, indeed. Okay. And you did that for each swab that you did on Mary Catherine Edwards, is that correct? I did. All right. Now, as far as the, the asphyxiation, you noted the bruising around the upper leg area, the, the pelvic area, is that correct? The upper, upper thigh area? Yes, I did. And that is consistent with her being bent over the edge of a bathtub, is that correct? Uh, in my opinion, yes, it is. Okay. And with her being bent over, you noted that she was not a very large person. She was kind of small and petite, is that correct? Yes. And after a struggle with someone who's got her cuffed, is it possible that she became tired? Yes. And being bent over that bathtub, there would not be any bruising if she was just being mashed up against the wall of that broad tub underneath where she's slumping over the tub. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And being tired, she would have trouble breathing, wouldn't she? I, I think so. Now, um, the pressure of from being bent over the bathtub could be transmitted into the abdomen and uh, pushed up against the diaphragm as well. Okay. And the diaphragm, of course, is necessary for breathing. Yes, sir. And as far as sexual assault, when you look at the entire circumstances, not just whether there was damage to or any type of injury to the vaginal area or the anal area, when you look at the total circumstances of the handcuffs, the, the circumstances of her being bent over a bathtub, the circumstances of all the bruises on her body, and the, and the circumstances of her death, does it appear to you that she was sexually assaulted? Yes, it does. Is that consistent with sexual assault if there was semen found in both cavities? Yes. Does a vaginal area, what, what is the vaginal area designed for? Is it designed uh, for several things? Well, yes. Okay. Is one of them sex? One of them is sex, yes. In order to have intercourse, you have to have something inserted into the vagina. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. It's made for. It's made to accept a penis during sex. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Does not necessarily ever cause any kind of bruising or damage when that occurs. Is that correct? Um, yeah, that's correct. Yes. Okay. So, is it unusual in a sexual assault, in your opinion and in your experience, that there would be no injury to the vaginal area in a sexual assault? No, that's not unusual. It's probably uh, a usual finding. Okay. 
Now, the anal area, you, you mentioned that that, in your opinion, if there was semen in there, that, that opening of it would be because of a sexual assault. Is that correct? I think so. Right. Now, if there was no semen in there, you might you might differ your opinion a little bit, but you would you would say that there, in your opinion, if there was semen, that would be consistent with it. Yeah, if semen is present, yes, that would be consistent with the solidization. And the struggle of using fingernails, you mentioned the fact that she was bound with her hands behind her back with handcuffs. Is that correct? It is. And is it is it your opinion that because she had those hands bound behind her back, there was no way for her to flail and scratch and, and defend herself? Well, at the time that her hands are bound behind her back, Correct. yes. Okay. But at that time, it, with, those, with those behind her, she could not defend herself that way? Uh, no. Okay. And last but not least, you're still, even after talking to the defense attorney, you're still of the opinion that the evidence is consistent with asphyxiation. Is that correct? Yes, I, I think so. Okay. I'd like to just say that that's uh, the type of asphyxiation is what's called entrapment asphyxiation, so that you cannot uh, use your muscles to breathe and to exchange air um, so, uh, you know, this sort of thing happens in uh, uh, a lot of different circumstances. Uh, I had a young man who was trapped in a silo. Yes, sir. You mentioned that earlier, sir. Okay. So, I don't want to be repetitive, but these sorts of things occur with folks who are in a stampede a soccer match in, uh, in Europe and uh, people are pressed up against a restraining fence and they can't breathe yes. and they die. Um, thank you, Doctor. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Yeah. Any recross exam? No. All right. Is this uh, is the doctor excused? Please do. You're excused, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Very, very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a break for lunch. Can all of you return back at 1.30? 1.30. Please remember the instructions that is available again. Everyone to remain seated while the jury exits first, please. Thank you.
I'm doing just fine. How long has it been since you retired? Um, about 20, 24 years. Do me a favor and tell us, who, what, tell us your name and where you used to work. My name is Boyd L. Lamb, Sr. I used to work at Beaumont Police Department. And when you worked in Beaumont Police Department, did you work there your whole career? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir, until I retired. Okay, and that was in early 2000s? 2003. Okay. And um, when you worked at Beaumont Police Department, uh, what in what departments did you work over the years that you were there? Started out in patrol, uh, <laughs> went, in, went into uh, ID Bureau, and uh, got out of ID, and went back to patrol, and then I retired. So... Patrol and ID Bureau, those are a little bit different, aren't they? Uh, yes, sir, they are. When you're working in the ID Bureau, what what kind of main function or some of the main functions of what your, what your role is in responding to calls uh, and then assisting uh, investigators? Yes, sir. I, I believe the more common term nowadays is CSI. 
Um, when we received calls, we went and uh, processed the crime scenes and photographed, fingerprinted, collected evidence. Okay. And in that capacity, did you and some other uh, ID technicians at BPD respond to a, a particular location uh, at 1005 Park Meadow on January 14th, 1995? Yes, sir, we did. And you were working in the ID division at that time? Yes, sir. Who was the, the sergeant of the ID division in, on that uh, January 14th, 1995. Oh, Sergeant Tatum. And that was Bill Tatum? Bill Tatum, yes, sir. As he says, passed? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Um, there were some other ID technicians at, uh, at the scene with you? Yes. Uh, I take uh, Williams and also uh, a technician uh, Sarah Moon. Okay. So tell me a little bit about what... Well, first of all, did you uh, do you have a copy of your report? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. Would it help you uh, to be able to refer to that um, during your testimony to refresh your memory? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. So, specifically, what time did you go to the scene at 1005 Park Meadow on January 14, 1995? Okay, approximately uh, 1430 hours. I was at home at my residence when I was called by... Um, technician Williams, and she said she advised me that my uh, assistance would be needed at uh, the 1005 Park Meadow in reference to a possible homicide. Okay. Now, when you get called to the scene, um, it's for purposes of, of pro helping process that scene. What's your what was your process as far as what you did when you first arrived and kind of how you approached um, you know getting the lay of the land? Okay, when I arrived, I talked to uh, technician Sarah Moon. Uh, she so showed me the scene. She also advised me that all the photographs and videotaping had taken place already. Uh, so we began to process the scene for fingerprints and collect evidence. Okay, so, um, and Sarah Moon testified yesterday, and we were able to see some of the photos that she uh, took and also the video that she uh, recorded of the crime scene. Um, you're saying you arrived after that had already taken place? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Located uh, exhibits two and three, which have been admitted into evidence. Um, okay, so Boyd, uh, you helped process the scene. Uh, what, what did that entail as far as after uh, ID Tech Moon had already taken that video and, and done the photographs of the scene and, and Catherine Edwards' body and all those things? Okay, well, um, once uh, we finished processing the scene and uh, several items of evidence was collected and... Uh, we uh, and the body was already removed from the scene. At that point in time, I was advised to uh, be en route to the morgue in reference to uh, take photographs and collect evidence off the uh, victim. Okay, so there was uh, 
clothing and things like that on uh, Catherine Everett's body that was en route to the, uh, the, the morgue. Yes, sir. Um, and they asked you to go and assist with the autopsy? Yes, sir. Did you, uh, We the jury saw photographs from that autopsy earlier this morning. Did you take those photographs? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. Uh, and do you recall who the, the pathologist was that was doing the autopsy? Uh, I believe his name was uh, Harvey, or, or let's see. Yes, sir. Dr. Harvey. Okay. Dr. Charles Harvey. I'm not sure what his first name was. Okay. Um, there were a number of items that you helped collect at the original scene at 1005 Park Meadow. Yes, sir. Went there, right? Yes, sir. Was one of those items a, a comforter that was on Catherine Edwards' bed in her master bedroom? Yes, it was. Okay. State's Exhibit 81, does this appear to be one of the, uh, a photograph of the master bedroom uh, at 1005 Park Meadow? Yes, sir. And is that the comforter uh, that we're looking at on top of that bed right there that you collected? Yes, it is. Okay. And uh, State's 82, is that the same thing, just from a different angle? Yes, sir. It's got like a, a little bit of a floral pattern to it. Yes, sir. I believe it's white on the back side. It's show you what's been admitted as State's Exhibit 45. Just kind of turn here. Does this appear to be the comforter that you collected, the contents of State's Exhibit 45? Yes, it is. We'll, we'll talk about where, where you, what you did and where you took these things uh, later, but I want to get through some of the other items that you collected, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, what about... Were, were, the, were the other uh, main items that you were tasked with collecting uh, as far as physical items of evidence uh, from the, taken from the autopsy? Yes, sir. Okay. So... You go to the autopsy, and you're basically photographing as instructed by Dr. Harvey? Yes, sir. He would tell you what he wanted to photograph, and you would take it? Yes, sir. And and then did you watch uh, Dr. Ho uh, Harvey perform the autopsy from start to finish? Yes, sir, I did. Did you watch Dr. Harvey collect evidence during that autopsy? Yes, sir, I did. And did you watch Dr. Harvey uh, take oral, vaginal, and anal swabs of Catherine Edwards' body during the autopsy? Yes, sir. Did you watch Dr. Harvey take those swabs and put them in the boxes, secure them into evidence, and hand them, or, and then put them into the same kit? Yes, sir. So, when you received that same kit, was it in sealed condition? Yes, sir. He sealed it in front of me. And then, where did you take it after that? I took it to submit it to evidence so it could be submitted to the lab. Okay. So you, uh, and is it fair to say you took the same kit along with the other items um, at the same time? Yes, sir. Okay. So if the same kit was submitted to you in sealed condition, did you open it at any, point, at any point? No, sir. If it was submitted to you in sealed condition and you didn't open it, 
Um, would your initials be on the outer, on this, the exterior of this box uh, in any way? Uh, no, sir. I don't believe so. Would you have only initialed it if you had opened it? Yes, sir. Okay. But what you took from Dr. Harvey and took to the station was a sealed uh, sexual assault kit. Yes, sir. Uh, Go ahead. Is there that, something? That's normally what happens, yes. And uh, I'm going to show you what we've got marked here as States Exhibit 32. It's got uh, Sergeant Tatum's initials on the box. You see uh, Bill Tatum's initials? Yes, sir. Sometime after the fact? Yes, sir. Um, do you also see over towards the the front, kind of where the where the box opens, a uh, a black marker writing with a date? Yes, sir. What date is that? Uh, it's uh, nine fourteen of ninety five. Take, take a little bit closer look for me. Is that a one or a nine? Fourteen ninety five. I can't tell. It, it may be a one. Uh, Does that zero kind of have a little bit of a gap between itself and the one, meaning O one? Yeah. Yeah, it's one fourteen ninety five. Okay. Um, and is that the the date that you went and observed Dr. Harvey uh, perform the autopsy on Catherine Edwards' body? Yes, sir. Um, what? Would that potentially be the, the seal that Dr. Harvey uh, wrote when he handed you the same kit? Yes, sir. Uh, the same kit that you received, um, did, it, did it look like the box that is marked as States Exhibit 32? Yes, sir. Uh, and if you look inside, do you see... This is, if you hold this up to the light, do you see a name on this line at the very bottom? Yes, sir. It's, it says Dr. Harvey. Okay. Um, does it appear to you that States Exhibit 32 is the same kit that you took possession of after the autopsy of Catherine Edwards? Yes, sir, it does. Okay. So, Officer Lamb. You take possession of the same kit. There's some other things that you take possession of from that autopsy as well, right? Yes, sir, there is. Okay. Let me show you what has been admitted as... Uh, you know what? I'll do it over here. Officer Lamb, if you uh, need to see closer, there's a TV right behind you as well, but I'll try and zoom in as best I can. All right. So I'm going to show you what's been admitted as States Exhibit 2. Uh, this is a front and back sheet. Do you recognize this form, Officer Lamb? Yes, sir. And looking at this, is this the uh, submission January 14, 1995 for the autopsy of Catherine Ed Mary Catherine Edwards? Yes, sir. Uh, she went by Catherine. Yes, sir. Is that your understanding? Yeah, that's what I understood. Yes, sir. And the, the board uh, ID number, is what is that? 95-011. Uh, okay. So there's, and there were there two different forms like this, chain of custody forms, that you received when you took possession of the evidence from the autopsy? Yes, sir. What, what is this form supposed to signify? It's supposed to signify what's in that, what's in the sexual assault kit. What we were referring to is Exhibit 32, that box. Yes, sir. Okay. And is it supposed to also, if I look on the back of State's Exhibit 2, what is this supposed to signify? That is chain of custody. Okay, so what are, what are we looking at right here? Uh, it's got an exhibit number 1 through 13, right? Yes, sir. And then it gives the date? Yes, sir. And is that Charles, uh, Dr. Harvey's signature as the person releasing this evidence? Yes, sir. And who's the one that's receiving this evidence? That's my signature. Okay. So on Exhibit 2, we have 13 items listed, right? That's correct. 
and you observed Dr. Harvey put all 13 of these items in that same kit, Exhibit 32, and sealed it. Yes, sir. And then he handed it to you? Yes, sir. Okay. So, Exhibit 3, is this the other chain of custody form that we were just talking about? Yes, it is. Okay, so that uh, is a, is this a chain of custody for evidence from that same autopsy that we were just talking about? Yes, sir, it is. But is this different evidence? What is this? It's evidence that was recovered off the body. Okay. So, looking at State's Exhibit 3, there is up here reference to one bag, is that correct? Yes, sir. And containing each one of these exhibits. Yes, sir. And so on this first page of exhibit three, we have 13 items, is that correct? Yes, sir. But it also says continued over here at the far right, doesn't it? Yes, sir. So if we flip over, We go to that same bag all the way down to how many items? 16. Okay. Were those considered to be trace items that Dr. Hardy uh, pulled either off Catherine Edwards' clothing or a body or, um, you know, hair that he pulled from during that autopsy? Yes, sir. So what about these other three items, 17, 18, and 19? What are those? Uh, those are items that uh, I picked up. And sealed up. Okay. Now, did you drew a little, uh, or somebody drew a little line here. Is that because those items were separated from that bag with those original 16 trace items? Yes, sir. Okay. The entry on the second page of State's Exhibit 3 for item 17, Smith & Wesson handcuffs. Yes, sir. It has a serial number associated with that. Yes, sir. What's that serial number? Uh, on, on this exhibit, what's the serial oh, number? Oh, okay. C27407. And did you note the collection of those handcuffs in your report? Yes, sir, I did. And what was the serial number that you noted in your report when you collected those handcuffs? Uh, C27407. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been admitted as State's Exhibit 36. This is a packaging with its contents. It's got a little tag on it, doesn't it? Yes, sir. What's that tag say? Uh, it says the incident number, which is 95-1246, and that's my name. Okay, so is that what you um, stapled to that? bag, that clear plastic bag, when you put these handcuffs, uh, took possession of them and put them into evidence? Yes, sir. Okay. And if you could, pull these out here. Are you able to, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll pop it over here. On these handcuffs, the contents of State's Exhibit 36. Are you able to discern a serial number on those handcuffs? Yes, to, yes sir. It's uh, C27407. Okay. So they, you're very confident, or are you very confident that these are the handcuffs that you took, uh, or that Dr. Harvey removed from Catherine Edwards' body? Yes, sir. And you took possession of it at the autopsy? That's correct. Okay. Handcuffs have serial numbers when they're, uh, you know, real handcuffs. Yes, sir. What uh, what do those serial numbers uh, signify? It's just an identifying mark, or identify the way I identify each pair of handcuffs. Meaning that if the manufacturer ever needed to be able to identify what, how many handcuffs and where they were. Um, or who they were originally sold to, they would have some potentially some record of that. Yes, sir, that's correct. Um, 
did you or were you asked to look into um, whether or not there were any there was any evidence on these handcuffs um, after you took possession of them from the autopsy? Yes, sir. I brought them back to the station and processed them for prints. Okay. And what do you recall um, in the findings it, um, on, on the handcuffs? It was negative results. Okay. So there were no fingerprints on these handcuffs? No, sir. Is that... Are handcuffs a, 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 a very good surface if they've been touched by a lot of hands? Or oh, I would say a, a medium surface. I mean, it's not real smooth. And it's not real rough either. I mean, it's not impossible, but it's uh, tough to and get to get latent prints off of them. And if there were, say, a struggle where there was, you know, potentially hand, hands touching the area where those handcuffs were, multiple different locations, times uh, that might smudge and make it difficult to have any prints. Oh yes, sir. Okay. Did you also? Take possession of a towel and a the T-shirt that Catherine Edwards was wearing. Yes, sir, I did. And those are uh, items seventeen or are those items eighteen and nineteen on this uh, state's exhibit three? Yes, sir. Okay. These have already been admitted to evidence, but I just want to make sure that you're. Recognize these as the towel and t-shirt that you took possession of. Looking at States Exhibit 37, does that appear to be the night shirt that you took from the autopsy of Catherine Edwards? Yes, it is. And looking at States Exhibit 38. Does that appear to be the blue and black striped towel that you took possession of at the autopsy of Catherine Edwards? Yes, it is. And Officer Lamb, uh, as far as the all this evidence, you, you now have it, the autopsy and the comforter, and you're going back to the station to log this into property, right? Yes, sir. Is that the typical procedure um, for how you would log evidence to make a record of what was checked in? Yes, sir. However, were, was there a, a special request um, from your ID sergeant, Bill Taylor? Uh, yes. Did he want you to hold on to three specific items of evidence for immediate testing? Yes, sir. And also for further investigation. Okay. And was one of those items, the item 17, the handcuffs that you uh, searched for fingerprints on? Yes, sir, they were. Okay, so you did not uh, immediately log those into uh, property when you took those back to the station. You took them to ID? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, I'll show you what I've marked as State's Exhibit 105. Do you recognize that? Yes, sir. Okay, what is that right there, uh, Officer Lane? That's my submittal for, form for the pair of handcuffs. Okay, and it's, ha, does it have the same serial number as the uh, other yes, sir. recordings of it? Um, when did you ultimately, um, and let me show you what's marked as State's Exhibit 107 as well. Is that another mm -hmm. submittal form that you completed? Yes, it is. And does it indicate when you ultimately submitted these handcuffs and turned them into property because you were done with your test? Uh, one, yes, sir. What date is that? Uh, one twenty-six ninety-five. Okay, so you took possession of them on the fourteenth of ninety-five, yes. January fourteenth. Yes, sir. And then uh, did your testing at the station? Yes, sir. And then they went into evidence. Yes, sir. And you found no fingerprints on these handcuffs that you could discern. No, sir, I didn't. Okay. Um, now, what about? the other items, the trace items from the autopsy. Did you turn those and log those into property immediately on going to the station? Yes, sir. Okay. And was that is that reflected in uh, State's Exhibit 107 here? Yes, sir. Okay. 
And those items, you were not asked to do any additional testing with those items, were you? No, sir. That's, those kind of items aren't really uh, in your specialty of what you were able to test. No, sir. Those, all, that, uh, all those items were collected for the uh, crime lab. Um, how did uh, Sergeant Tatum ask you to hold two specific items for him to take possession of? Yes, sir. And would those two items be item 18 up here on States Exhibit 3 and item 19 up here on States Exhibit 3? Yes, sir. Okay. And with that, that's the towel and the T-shirt? Yes, sir. Did Sergeant Tatum also ask you to hold the sexual assault kit, uh, the box, for him to take possession of? No, sir. He, what did, uh, he told you to do something with it, didn't he? Yeah, you'd submit it to ID, where, I mean, not ID, to uh, property uh, where, it, where it was locked up. And then from there, he would check it out of uh, the property division. Okay, so you um, you did not log it into property, but you did lock it up in property. Yes, sir. Okay, and uh, Sergeant Tatum, um, did, did you ever uh, learn whether or not he picked it up? No, sir. Okay, so you don't know anything about that. No, sir. Once I turned it in, turned it in, I knew it was in a secure location, and I my job was done. Okay, but you are are you? Uh, confident that what I've got this box here, States Exhibit 32, that this looks like the same uh, sexual assault kit that you took possession of and the one that you logged into uh, or locked up in property? Yes, sir. Okay. And as far as the uh, items 17 or items 18 and 19 here, the towel and the shirt, did you personally hand those to Sergeant Tatum, or what do you recall about that? No, sir. They were submitted to property so that they'd be secure. Okay, so they were locked up as well. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, now, if are there lockers at property where you can lock up evidence? Yes, sir. And someone from property maintains that key. Until, yes, sir. Uh, and let me, let me get my question out to you. Okay. Someone maintains that key so that they, you know, whoever is supposed to come pick it up, the person at property gives them the key. Yes, sir. It's it's checked out. <laughs> it stays in a secured area until it, they sign for it. Okay. And um, as far as what happened with these items of evidence. After you secured them, uh, do you have any knowledge about that? No, sir. How much longer uh, after uh, this scene in January of 1995 did you work in ID division? I got out in 1998. You, did you uh, want to go back to patrol at some point in your career? Yes, sir. ID is kind of a grind, isn't it? Yes, sir. And you have to work some pretty troublesome scenes. Yes, sir. Um, so later down the road, if there's um, any handling of these items by BPD or ID or anyone, you, you eventually didn't uh, either work in that department. Uh, correct. Officer Lamb, if we could, I think this is really the last thing I need to ask you about. Um, your processing of the uh, scene at 1005 Park Meadow. Yes, sir. Um, did you go through that scene with ID Tech Moon and ID Tech Williams and look for uh, locations where you could potentially pull uh, any kind of lady fingerprints? Yes, sir. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, what you remember or what your report indicates you uh, looked at specifically? Can I read directly from my report? Um, yes, but as long as that is refreshing your memory of what you did. I 
believe, just for clarification, I think I'm looking at the first page of your report. That yes, sir. Uh, okay, just make sure. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I, I processed the top left bedpost rail, the front right of the bed rail facing down, and a bedroom door entering into the bathroom right side straight across from the doorknob on the right side of the door frame. And you uh, did or did you lift any or find any late fingerprints on those surfaces? Also, uh, I processed a um, latents were lifted off of a uh, hand, hand side bed post in the north upstairs bedroom, and no other latents were lifted. Okay, and were, were there latents that were lifted from those surfaces that you just described? Yes, sir. Okay, now did you ever have any anybody to compare them to? No, sir. Did, well, go ahead. Yes, sir. The, they asked for comparisons of a lot of people, but it came out negative. Okay. Um, did you also, um, or I guess, were you able to before the conclusion of Catherine's autopsy look at, to see if all if they were potentially her fingerprints? <clears throat> no, sir. Um, is that conceivable that she might have fingerprints in her own home? Yes, sir. Uh, is that something that when you're processing a scene you've seen before where it's a fingerprint but it's the person who lives there? Yes, sir. That being said, the, of the folks that they did ask you to compare to, you never found any uh, match? No. Um, were you ever asked anything about an individual by the name of Clayton Foreman? No, sir. Do you know this man right now? No, sir, I sure don't. Thank you, Officer. Uh, Mr. Burbank, can I ask a question? Well, I appreciate your time. Good afternoon. Afternoon. How have you been? Fine. How's retirement? Oh, it's it was good up until a couple of days ago. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see how enjoyable I can finish this off. Okay. Officer, I got some questions for you as you're ready to go You were sent to the location, and as the state just finished up talking to you about, you pulled off latent prints around the bedroom, which uh, I believe would be state's exhibit. I'm going to just going to show you state's exhibit 82. Okay. <coughs> Was familiar, right? Yes, sir. And you did pick off latent prints, or you did recover latent prints that were usable for comparison in a number of areas. Is that correct? Yes, sir. One of the questions that was asked was whether or not you compared uh, Miss Edwards' fingerprints. That would almost be a given to make sure that you're not looking at the victim, especially in light of other people that you would have to compare to. Why waste your time, right? Well, normally the, the victim's prints are compared to any lightens that are lifted out of the residence. Right. That's, that's normal course. So when you ask whether or not, oh, wouldn't it have been, been nice or would, wouldn't, uh, it could have been Miss Edwards' uh, prints, you, you already ruled her out just by normal course of, of doing business. Right? I don't, I don't recall. Was, right. You don't recall? It's been 30 years. Yeah, it's been 30 years. Well, it was normal course and protocol of, you know, they, they took her for the birds, right? Yes, sir, I did. Right. And you, I, you did whatever you needed to do uh, to compare them to whatever you, you got at the scene. Yes, sir. Um, how many other people did you compare, roughly? Uh, other fingerprints? People that uh, you thought were subject? I don't recall. Uh, More than one? Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. You said people, so there had to be more than one. I had no. I have no idea how many suspects they had. Uh, you don't know how many 
many times you had to take the fingerprints out? No, sir. Uh, more than five? Don't know. Out. Don't know. But they had a lot of suspects in there. I guess I did, yes, sir. Okay. One question, too, as I have state's exhibit number 82 up, something was said prior, I think it was yesterday sometime, in reference to this. There's a cap missing. See the cap on the other side? Yes, sir. And there was testimony that this was part of the struggle, possibly. Uh, did you ever find the cap? No, sir. Not that you can recall, it's not in your report, right? No, sir. And you went through that room with latent prints and yes, sir. covering the bed covers and stuff like that? Yes, sir. But you never saw that or there's nothing in your report that says you got that? No, sir. Okay. Handcuffs. Um, questions were say, said or asked of you that well, because so many people uh, have used it to surface, things like that, probably possibility there would be no prints. None of the questions? That's a good possibility, yes, sir. Right. Uh, and you said there possibly could be. The, the surface was average. Yes, sir. Uh, but one thing that couldn't be wiped away or gone is the serial number. Right? Correct. And through the questioning of the state to you is the serial number was put on by the manufacturer, right? Yes, sir. So that at a future date, they could probably go back and find out where they came from. Remember that question asked to you? Yes, sir, that's and, possible. And you and you agreed? Yes, sir. It was Smith & Wesson, a well-known company, right? Yes, sir. Uh, were you ever asked to do that? No, sir. Um, do you know of any investigator, through your personal knowledge, that would ever try to find out what agency or what part, country, city, whatever, might those handcuffs have been sold to? I wasn't, I wasn't privy to that information. Okay. But, well, my question is, you don't know of, of anybody trying to do that? No, sir, I don't. Okay. Once you took your fingerprints, uh, I know that you saved them uh, probably in the evidence room, right? Yes, sir. Um, do you, and you have no now, once you left uh, 98, uh, you don't know if anybody took them out to try to process them again or co compare them to anything else? No, sir, I wasn't aware of it. Okay. Uh, in reference to, and we talked to, at length about the uh, evidence uh, logs, the chain of custody, and these are, and I'm looking at uh, states three, which were 16 items, Sorry about that, up to there, and states two, which was, I guess, the sexual assault kit. But going back to states three, do you know what they did with those hair fibers and other things uh, from 1 to 16, do you know if they were sent off anywhere to be processed? No, sir. You just collected them and brought them? That's correct. Was that, was hair used back then in 95? I, I was told that in 95 DNA was just starting out uh, being uh, firm, uh, relative, uh, being used. Was hair used to try to identify people or at least that type of person or some type of category? All that stuff was collected for possible future identification. Yeah. And my question though is, uh, officer, is was, was that kind of the way you started like whittling down people or suspects is comparing hair and other trace evidence? No, sir. That, that would be submitted to the lab. Yeah. But through your knowledge. I understand that. That be a lot, but is that how they used to do trying to identify people? Yes, yeah, sir. One of the ways, right? A one blood, way. Blood types were, were another type. Uh, fingerprints. You, you'd have to talk to a lab technician. You just collected it. That's it. Okay. Um, the other thing that I, I, I noticed and I want to talk to you about is you also. 
put back on States Exhibit 82. Okay? You also took into custody, did you not, or, or as evidence, okay? Uh, one blue and white fitted bed sheet. Yes, yes, sir. And was that from that bed right there? Yes, sir. Uh, and a blue and white top sheet. Was that from that bed right there? Yes, sir. Um, a blue and white, and I guess the blue and white comforter is about 45. Uh, down the box. You looked at it, right? Yes, sir. Comforter. Yes, sir. Okay. And two pillowcases. Right? Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. And you also took two pillowcases, right? Yes, sir. And it looks like it was being used. I mean, it's kind of propped up, kind of being used by whoever was laying in the bed. Does it look like that to you? Yes, sir. I mean, it's not, the bed's not made up or anything. Um, whatever happened to those items for testing? Um, I have no idea. Do you know if anyone took them out of the evidence locker uh, to have them tested? No, sir, I don't. But you collected them because there possibly could have been some type of evidence or something uh, to help you in your investigation. Yes, sir. And that was no normal protocol. Yes, sir. You made note when you got out of the scene you had a conversation with another investigator who was either uh, Moon or Williams. And they asked, uh, or there was a notation of whether or not there was any forced entry into the house. Did you look at the ports of entry in the house? Yes, sir. Uh, I think one was a garage door and then there was a back door into the garage. Um, patio door, uh, but I think the patio was enclosed, wasn't it? That you couldn't get in? Except I don't I don't, re don't remember. But point being is, is that there were no signs of forced entry at all. No, sir. None. And in fact, uh, you made note that from what your investigation was, this item was all locked up. Yes. At the time that the parents came in and discovered Correct. Do you know if anyone tried to dust around the points of entry to try to either get any latents or any type of evidence from? No, sir. Uh, okay. uh, was any, if there wasn't a forced entry, a, a entry, any keys, anything that would, how possibly someone could possibly get in uh, that residence? No, sir. That you know. You didn't collect anything. No, sir. That wasn't bad, was it? Not too bad. Somebody to recall your honor passing. Officer Lamb, I want to ask you about one picture here. Looking at States Exhibit 81. You see over here on the left side of that bed where the fitted sheet and all the uh, bedding is pulled up off the uh, mattress? Yes, sir. Did did you believe when you saw this scene in this master bedroom that there was signs, evidence of a struggle of some kind? Yes, sir. Is that why you collected the comforter? Yes, sir. Otherwise, what would be the purpose to have collected the comforter if you didn't think that? Just evidence collection. Uh, possibility may come up later on for uh, to be uh, examined by a lab. And is that because you believed or that there was a belief of those that were at that scene that there was some form of struggle in that room? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, questions? Well, Mr. Lamb, and that's the reason why you've got the pillowcase, the top sheet, the bottom sheet, because you did think there was a struggle in there, possibly, right? Yes, sir. So you took it all? Yes, sir. But you don't know what was tested and what wasn't tested? No, sir, I don't. And if the comforter was only tested uh, from the bed, so be it. You had nothing to do with it. 
Yeah. No, sir. Please, you are excused, sir. Oh, thank you. Your next witness is it should be long or short. Shouldn't be too long, Judge. Want to call or to take a break? We well, take a break. It's been about an hour. Let's take a short break, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, five, ten minutes. We'll report back outside. Thank you. Everyone else who makes it.
testimony that you were about here. Shall we the truth, but the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Uh, please have a seat. Sir? Just fine. Tell us your name and uh, what you do. Uh, my name is George Mitchell Woods, and I'm presently retired. I heard you had some sort of Duck Dynasty looking beard um, not too long ago. You shaved to come to court? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what did you used to do, though? I retired as a uh, sheriff here in Jefferson County into 16. Prior to that, I worked for the district attorney's office, uh, was the chief criminal investigator for Tom Manus. And before that, I was a uh, Port Arthur police officer for about 13 years. Is that where you got your start at uh, Port yes. Arthur PD? Yes, in 1974. Oh my gosh. Um, and then you worked at uh, the district attorney's office uh, for a number of years. I did, for 10 years. Okay. Uh, and, then, and then after that, you you were uh, sheriff for a while. Weren't I you? was the elected sheriff. Okay. Um, well, I'm asking about uh, some of the things that you did back when you were the chief investigator at the district attorney's office. You remember a, a case that was investigated uh, involving a homicide, uh, Catherine Edwards? Absolutely. Did you uh, do you remember uh, working with Bill Tatum uh, at BPD ID? In yes. That case for yes. A while. Did you did you do anything at the scene initially, um, or was was everything or your involvement start later after that? I was present at the scene, uh, not initially. Uh, back at that time, it was uh, very common practice. Uh, the DA investigators worked very closely with all the law enforcement agencies in in our county. Uh, it was not uncommon on a major crime for them to notify us and we would respond as well. Okay, so that, this was what was occurring as far as you working with um, the Beaumont Police Department. That was very common practice for, you know, homicides and other very serious cases? Yes, it was. Okay. And so after... Uh, investigators went in and started to process these scenes, did you and Sergeant Tatum uh, start to look into options for submitting evidence for DNA comparisons? Yes. Um, you say options. Uh, the use of DNA in law enforcement at that time was a fairly new uh, tool um, and so absolutely uh, the collection of evidence that might possibly contain DNA was of primary concern. Was this one of the earlier cases that you remember where DNA was a big focus of the case? Yes. And you mentioned that I said options earlier. Is that because when you and Sergeant Tatum started looking into you know, what path you could take as far as labs that could help with this, there were not very many? No, there were not. Uh, it, I, I would say it was in its infancy back at that time. It was, you know, it was used in other places, but uh, it was not real common for us in this area at that time. We're, there had been other cases, and uh, it, was, uh, it was, was a very impressive tool to be utilized in, in criminal investigations. And because of the nature of this particular homicide, where it was believed that she was sexually assaulted uh, during the commission of the murder, um, was that something that you and Sergeant Tatum and other investigators were focused on heavily as far as potential DNA evidence? Yes, absolutely. So in that vein, did you and Sergeant Tatum uh, have some evidence that you 
specifically pulled to go and take to a lab somewhere? There, our concern uh, at that time was uh, any evidence that was present at the scene that, that the possibility existed that there might be DNA uh, retrieved or extracted from, from that evidence. Uh, not only that, but hair samples, uh, things of that nature. Uh, it was very routine to try to uh, collect and preserve that evidence. Okay. And so, um, do you recall sometime a few days shortly after um, the homicide on January 14th, 1995, you and Sergeant Tatum taking some of these items of evidence that had been collected and uh, going somewhere with them? Sergeant Tatum and I uh, took the bed linens that were uh, obtained at the scene uh, uh, article of clothing from the victim's body uh, and a rape evidence kit that was collected uh, at the time of autopsy. A uh, decision was made to uh, take some of that evidence to the FBI crime lab and as well to the uh, Cellmark uh, DNA for DNA analysis, Cellmark's lab. Cellmark was a, a, is still a private lab? Yes, it, it is a private lab. Go ahead. Uh, the benefit that Cellmark offered to us uh, was their turnaround time on the analysis of, of any DNA evidence was quicker than uh, the FBI lab, uh, but it's a com it was a commercial operated business, so you have to pay for that analysis. But uh, so that's one reason evidence was taken to both places. Okay. So is it fair to say that what you and Sergeant Tatum ultimately ended up doing was taking things that were going to be looked at for trace evidence to the FBI? Yes. And things that were going to be looked at for potential DNA comparisons to a private lab by the name of Selmar? Yes, sir. Okay. And do you recall on... January 24th, 1995, flying up to go take these items uh, in person. Yes. Did you and uh, Sergeant Tatum, where did y'all uh, get the items of evidence that y'all were going to take? They were, uh, Beaumont Police Department had, uh, was retaining the uh, physical evidence that was collected. Um, Sergeant Tatum got the evidence uh, and we had as I said, uh, some bed linens, clothing, and some uh, the rape kit that contained some blood evidence and stuff, and we hand carried those, those items to Germantown, Maryland, to Selmark, and uh, the linens and I believe the shirt uh, to the FBI lab. Okay. Now, before, before we get on that flight, let me ask you this. Uh, did you and Sergeant Tatum also uh, have a particular potential suspect that you wanted to take uh, a sample from for purposes of comparison? Yes. Was that something that uh, was one of the earliest people that were looked at as far as the potential yes. killer for Kathy? Yes. Who was that? Uh, his last name was Perry. Okay. I believe what? David Perry. Uh, he was one of Catherine Edwards' uh, boyfriend at that at that time. They had had some sort of on and off relationship over the, a number of years. Yes. Did you and, and Sergeant Tatum, uh, in order to obtain a sample from David Perry, actually go and, and interview him, talk to him? Uh, yes, I did. You yeah. did. Okay. I did, and uh, I think I was accompanied by an investigator thrower in the DA's office. Okay. I had made contact with him, and uh, he he agreed to meet with me, and I drove over and met him in Houston and talked with him. Um, uh, blood sample and hair sample. Um, so t tell me a little bit about uh, when you did talk with David Perry. What, what was your impression of, of him and his responsiveness to what you were asking? Well, my, my impression of him was that, one, I, 
naturally anybody in that circumstances would I think would be nervous uh, a little scared um, you know for the, the set of circumstances that, that existed for him at that time um, you know I tried to put him at ease and, and let him understand uh, to use the old analogy that I use this, this law enforcement these investigations are like housework you do one room at a time and uh, right now they're kind of we're in your room and as soon as we get your room cleaned up we can move on to the next room and I told him um, you know and the, the surefire way to get you out of this is uh, through this uh, lab analysis of DNA uh, and he agreed uh, in fact he uh, drove over and and met me at, uh, at the medical facility at the jail on highway 69 and agreed and gave his hair sample and uh, uh, blood sample uh, for DNA analysis so he, he drove from Houston all the way to New Orleans to give you a sample he did um, and then you and uh, Sergeant Tatum, did y'all take that sample along with the other items? Yes, that that sample, the the evidence, was, the samples received from him, the blood and hair, uh, was transported uh, with the uh, other evidence that was that we had to take to the lab in Washington and and Selmar. Okay, and just you being sheriff, working a number of. Uh, you know, overseeing a number of investigative departments and then also working these kinds of cases uh, at, at the district attorney's office. Um, just help me understand, when, when a homicide occurs and, uh, you know, investigators are tasked with trying to ascertain what happened and, you know, who done it, uh, is it most common for pe people to kind of start at the nucleus, people that the victim knew? Absolutely. That's very routine. When that doesn't produce results, is it typical that you know there's going to be some plan to expand that search? Absolutely, you you expand your your search out. Was this the homicide of Catherine Edwards in that investigation? Was that a, an example of where uh, over time the search did have to expand? Yes. Um, ultimately, uh, do you ever recall um, getting reports back talking uh, or informing you that David Perry was excluded? Yes. Um, we did, I, I did get those reports. But okay. You you were specifically the person, I believe, uh, is this true, that, that we're supposed to monitor and receive those reports from Selmar? Well, Sergeant Tatum got the reports as well as I did. They were sent to both of us. And, um, but there was a report. He, David Perry was excluded as being a contributor to the DNA that was found at the scene. And did he seem, um, when you spoke to him, when you interviewed him, did he seem like you would expect, I suppose, for someone who found out that their longtime girlfriend had died? <laughs> it's been a long time, but there, wa there wasn't anything about him on, on the day that I met him in Houston and, and we visited and talked. Um, there wasn't anything about him that that raised any concerns that I that I had about him. Um, um, like I said, he was very cooperative and and agreed to come over uh, and drive over and 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 give hair and, and blood samples for analysis. Okay. So, Sheriff Woods. Um you take all these samples to Washington, D.C., um, to these two laboratories, correct? Yes. Let me show you. Let's start with what I have marked as Exhibit 98. Is this a, an FBI lab submission form?
Yes, it appears to be, yes. And is it, who are the two uh, on that first page there, Sheriff, that uh, are the submitting individuals? Uh, Sergeant Tatum and myself. Okay. Does this record right here, um, States Exhibit 98, does that refresh your memory about some of the items that were submitted to the FBI crime lab in Washington? Yes. Okay. And I think on that second page of State Exhibit 98, is, is that your handwriting? Uh, yes, on the, the below the line you see there, below that line, that yes. is my handwriting. You recognize that yes. as your handwriting? Yes. And uh, what are the two items that you specifically hand wrote in as far as uh, on this submission form? Uh, it's showing a uh, paper bag uh, with the victim's nightshirt. It was, uh, appears to be Q24. Is uh, these Q and K numbers, are those FBI crime lab numbers that are given to them when they go through the FBI? You know, I, I'm really not sure whether that is, that is an FBI number or a Beaumont Police Department number. Whoever is responsible for that uh, yeah. would, would know. Right. Okay. Uh, that was item number one in a paper bag and also a blue and black towel. Uh, this was uh, covering the victim at the scene, okay. covering her body, and that was uh, labeled with number Q25 uh, from a plastic bag. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, on that first page of Exhibit 98, is there also a reference to a comforter? in the description of items that were submitted. Yes, Q21 is one comforter. Okay. Uh, what about some right above that, uh, fitted sheets and top sheets? Q20 was a top sheet, uh, blue and white color. Q19 was a fitted sheet, uh, blue and white in color. And then right below where the comforter is listed is uh, our pillowcase is also listed. Two pillowcases, okay. uh, Q22 and Q23. Okay, so do you recall these items being submitted to the FBI in, yes. in bags that you and Sergeant yes, Tatum and they were, they were submitted there with Sergeant Tatum and I from the Beaumont Police Department. Okay, evidence. and what date specifically uh, does this record indicate you did that? Um, January 24th, 1995. Is that consistent with what you remember uh, about you and Sergeant Tatum flying up a, a week or so after the yes. 14th? Yes. Okay. So, do me a favor here. I'll take that back. Thank you, sir. You also went to a, a different laboratory for the DNA, though, right? Yes, to Selmar. Okay. I'm going to show you what's marked as State's Exhibit 99. Do you recognize this as a, a submission form for evidence to Cellmark Diagnostics? Yes. And who's the uh, the submitter? Well, my na my name on, is on there, Jim Woods and uh, Sergeant Tatum. Okay. So uh, it looks like Sergeant Tatum wrote his name, uh, or somebody wrote Sergeant yeah. Tatum's name at the very top. Yes. But then at the bottom, there's this part where it refers to the custody uh, of who took possession of what. I'll be honest with you, I can't make out the, the, this name here. Right. You don't, that's not your, anybody you know right there. No, I don't, I don't recognize this. I recognize Sergeant Tatum's uh, name and, and my name here. Right. I'm not sure. I can't quite read read that handwriting. It looks I'm not sure what it is. Does that appear to be maybe someone from Selmark? Yes. You might not have known who that. And I'm was. saying that because it's released by received by released by. So I'm assuming that someone at, yes, at Selmark that took custody of that, and I don't remember the name. Now, as far as what was taken to Selmark, you told us that you had uh, a evidence sample or a blood sample from David Perry. Yes. Was that taken to Selmar? Yes. Okay. Do you see that uh, reflected on 
States Exhibit 99. Maybe towards the bottom there. At zero, here it says zero, zero 05. Okay. Item zero, I'm assuming that's item zero 05. Uh, one purple top. Um, so one purple top vial of blood labeled Perry David A. Okay. And what else? Did, well, what else was was it that you and um, Sergeant Tatum took to sell Mark for DNA comparisons? Well, these items that are listed on on here above that would have all been been submitted to them at that time. And those items right uh, above that are those items that were contained within the sexual assault kit for yes. Catherine Edwards. Yes, what we refer to as a rape kit. It would, would have been items collected at that time and placed in that. Now, uh, Sheriff Woods, uh, when you and Sergeant Tatum picked up this sexual assault kit, um, did either one of you open it? No. So you took it in sealed condition from Beaumont PD, right? That's correct, yes. And delivered it in sealed condition to Cellmark Laboratories? Yes. Okay. And and then when did you watch as the, someone from Cellmark actually unsealed the sexual assault kit and then pick the items that they needed to retain? I, I can't tell you that I, I recall watching them un, unseal the kit. Obviously, they did because they've listed the items on the submission form, so they had to retrieve those from from the rape kit, and it would have not been been opened except there once it was given to them. With the person who unsealed that yes, kit, to the person that, that took that? custody and possession of it at that time. Because because you and Sergeant Tatum. And y'all's transit of this sexual assault kit, y'all never opened it. No. No. Okay. So, let me show you what's marked as States Exhibit 32. Now, not specifically to any case, but what does this States Exhibit 32 appear to be? It, it, it appears to be uh, the standard rape kit that was utilized by Jefferson County law enforcement at that time. Okay. And this is a, a homicide that uh, occurred on January 14th, 1995. Is that your recollection? Yes. And if you take a look, you might need your glasses. I know I do. Um, right here on the original seal for this, do you see a, a date that Looks like uh, 11495. Okay. So this does appear to be a sexual assault kit or a rape kit that was sealed on January 14th, 1995. Yes. And we're talking about States Exhibit 32 here. Do you also recognize that yes. signature on there or that, uh, those initials? That's uh, Sergeant Tatum's initials. Okay. Um, now, if you or if neither you nor Sergeant Tatum had opened this during your trip to D.C., would either one of you have put your initials on the outside of this box? Well, if it had been open, I mean, that would be standard practice. Whoever, uh, if someone were to open that, then protocol would be to reseal it and, and initial uh, the date and time that it, uh, date that it was opened and, and reseal the kit back at that time. Uh, it was not open by either one of us. Our, our purpose was to transport it to uh, the crime lab, uh, to sell Mark and to the FBI crime lab and maintain the integrity of that evidence to see that it stayed in our possession and no one tampered with it. Yes, sir, absolutely. Um, so is, is that why your initials and Sergeant Tatum's initials as far as January 24th, 1995, aren't found on the exterior of this box, right. uh, States Exhibit 32? Correct. And when I asked you about Sergeant Tatum, Tatum's initials earlier, that's a date later down uh, in 1997, isn't it? It appears, yes. Okay, so at some point, Sergeant Tatum handled this box uh, later down the road. Yes. Okay. States Exhibit 32, does this appear to be the sexual assault kit that you and Sergeant Tatum took 
to Cellmark Laboratories on January 24th, 1995. Yes, it does. Okay. to assist in this case uh, in various ways over the years? Is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. Uh, Y'all worked a lot on it, didn't you? There was a lot of work put into this case, no question about it. And uh, it, it's been open for a long time. People really wanted to find the killer back in 1995, did Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. <coughs> How you been? Good. Good to see you again. You as well. That if I didn't open the box, right, your initials wouldn't have been on it. There was no need to put your initials on it because correct. You it, right? But Sergeant Tatum's initials, my folks, was put on the side here, and it was at a later date. Correct, and I, you don't have to. But it was like was it ninety seven or ninety ninety five here? Question is. Were you there when he opened the box? Because if he has his initials, he probably opened it up. Do you, were you there when he opened it? No, no. Do you have any? I was present in Selmark with Selmark. him, but I wasn't present in 97 okay. when he opened the box. And the point being is, do you know why or what he did when he opened up this box? In 1997? Right. Yeah, no. No, so you had no idea no. why? But if his initials were on there, it, he probably opened it for some reason. You don't know for sure, but yeah, I'm you, you, correct. Okay. There was questions in reference to a suspect, and that was Mr. Perry. Uh, and there was testimony prior to you getting on the stand that their relationship was on and off and rocky and kind of tumultuous uh, type thing. Uh, and you went over to talk to him, right? Because he was a suspect. Everybody was pointing fingers at him. Uh, but when you say he was cooperative, uh, he lawyered up, didn't he? He had an, he had an attorney. At, at, I was not present when when he was uh, interviewed by the Beaumont Police Department. If I showed you something uh, that represents from one of your notes, would it help refresh your memory? Sure. Okay. May I approach this? Yes. To yourself, Sheriff, could you just uh, look at that? Okay. Right. Is that your handwriting? It is. Okay. And does it have the information of uh, David Perry on it? Does it have information? Yeah, does it have this information, like the name, telephone number, address? Yes. Okay. And included in that was a reference to his attorney. Let's read it. And I thought he did. <laughs> I don't want to walk back and forth all this time. Okay. You work faster on Does it have his attorney's telephone number and name it, on it? There is an attorney's name and phone number on right. there, and it, I now really don't recall whether that was his attorney or not. But, but those are your notes. That, that is my handwriting, right. my notes. Your, Correct. your handwriting, your notes. Correct. His information of how to contact him and where he's at. Okay. Yeah.
over the years, let me ask you this. How did you and Philmont PD start getting or start considering suspects? What, what was the criteria? Uh, we've heard a lot where, you know, you went from the obvious, like Perry, and then you started expanding. I remember talking about that, but it kind of expanded. How would a person become a suspect, specifically probably in this case? Well, it's, uh, there's any number, any number of ways that 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 someone could become a suspect or a person of interest in, in in this kind of investigation, and and that information is often uh, derived by talking to people that that knew her, uh, talking to people that may had knowledge or information about relationships that she had with someone, uh, be it friends, family, uh, co-workers, and, and that's that's how that information is gathered. People that she possibly had relations with. Yes. Um, and over this, this, I mean, this, over many years, I mean, in fact, it was still going on when you retired as sheriff, right? I mean, this investigation was still going on when you retired as, as sheriff, right? Yes. Yes, okay. So you started expanding, and I guess that's the point I was trying to get at is these people that you thought or, or looked into uh, possibly had some connection uh, with Miss Edwards. It could be possible, yes. Possible. Yes. And you had to eliminate these people. But there had to be some connection that you thought possibly was viable as a possible suspect before you would waste your time. I mean, there was some information that was there that said, I think we need to do something to eliminate that person. Very possible, yes. Absolutely. And what I'm getting at is, over the time uh, that you were part of this investigation, you sent off many samples of possible suspects to sell murder. Well, I don't know exactly how many uh, that I personally submitted. I well, know you, you know of it because you were kept in the loop, were you not? Well, for a certain period of time, I was. But yeah. and and when I say many, I mean it could be an access fifteen, twenty people that you sent off to Selmark for testing to I try to eliminate. I don't know how many were sent off. Um, but there were many. Uh, there were several. Well, more than several. Several is two or three. That's uh, that's not a given. Yeah. No, yeah, let's get specific. Several has a definition, but it's not quantitatively in exact science. Can you can you give a name or give a number? Can I? Yeah. Um, no, I can't, and I don't want you to give this jury the impression that I was working on this case for 20 years as I was sheriff. I, I did not actively work on this case uh, once I left the district attorney's office. I didn't, yeah, and I'm not implying that. What I'm implying, though, when you were an investigator in the DA's office, Okay. You were working on it. You, along with the other law enforcement, you were kept in the loop, submitted many names and samples for testing to someone. Did you agree with that? To try to eliminate suspects. There were several, but I can't tell you how many. The And the reason for that is the Beaumont Police Department was the lead agency investigating this thing. There is a possibility that they could have submitted uh, some samples that I didn't know about. So I guess some mark would be the, be the best person. A absolutely. Now, you did receive communications from some mark in reference to their testing. They ceased you. Um, yes, on some some of the analysis. But you can't give an exact number. No, I, I wasn't can't. asking you to. No, I can't. 
But you would agree that the people that they, they sent there uh, for testing probably had some connection or at least a suspicion that they could possibly have been involved. And you want to eliminate it. Common sense. Yeah, ob obviously there was importance to eliminating those people or looking at, at proof that they may have been a suspect in the case. So. After you left the DA's office, did you have, as an investigator, became sheriff? Uh, did you have any uh, other involvement with this case? No, I did not. FBI was used for trace analysis? Yes, I think. Hair fiber, and paint chips? I'm not certain that they didn't do some DNA analysis. I could be wrong about that. And cell mark was used basically for DNA, uh, yes. not, not any trace. Yes. And that's because of the speed of the turnaround back then. In Correct. Thank you. Pass the witness up for recall, Your Honor. Anything else for this thing? No, sir. You are excused, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Next witness, please. I'll carry on. My name is Kerry Oyen. It is spelled C A R Y O I E N. Where do you work? I work at the FBI laboratory located in Quantico, Virginia. And how long have you worked for them? I've worked for the FBI laboratory for almost 29 years. So back in January 24th of 95, were you working for the FBI laboratory at that time? I was not. Okay, when did you start? I actually started in on May 14th, 1995. So within just a couple months of, of when we had this submitted, is that correct? That is correct. All right, and policies and procedures were all the same when you started working there? That is correct. And did you recognize all the initials and things on the evidence that I'm about to show you as far as uh, who they are and where they work? I'm familiar with the people who were involved in the case, yes. In fact, was one of your supervisors? He was. Okay. So let's talk about, um, before we begin, back in 1995, you're familiar with the way that the FBI laboratory conducted its business and kept its records in mind, correct? Yes, very much so. And was it the normal course of business for the FBI laboratory to keep the records that we're going to talk about? Yes, it is. And was it were the records made by somebody at or near the time the event occurred? Yes, they were. And by somebody with personal knowledge of that event is recorded? Yes. And was it also uh, the normal course of business to keep these records? Yes, it was. Okay. And, and you, saying you're familiar, you're, you're familiar with all the records that we've submitted to you to look over for this tomorrow, correct? Yes, I am. And you are working those records for years, am I right? I have, yes. Okay. Matter of fact, we've, we've even had you on a prior case to look over some of these records in, from 1987, am I correct? That is correct. So let's talk about January 24, 1995. Um, was there a submittal made to the FBI laboratory on that date from a person by the name of Bill Tatum or W.C. Tatum in, in Woods? May I refer to my notes yes, just to recollect my collection? Thank you. Actually. Tell you what, let me show you what's marked as states exhibit 98. 
Why don't we look at this? Is that a submittal form? Yes, this is the evidence receipt form that is utilized uh, at the FBI laboratory when evidence is brought into, into the laboratory. And is, do you recognize that as being what we just talked about, the records that we talked about that you're familiar with? Yes, I do. That is correct. Tender states, I mean, yeah, states 98. No objection, 98. Admitted. Well, let's put these on the big board so we can all look out. So when we look at this form, and you can look up on the TV screen and get, get to where you need to be in your records. Okay. Okay. Up in the top left-hand corner right here, we see some numbers. Q1 through Q27 and K1 through K5. What are those? Those are the actual specimens, the items of evidence that were submitted to the laboratory. They were received in some sort of packaging, but then... As they were inventoried, we identified there were 27 what we call Q or questioned items, uh, and then five known items, so five known samples. So the K stands for known, the Q stands for questioned. That is correct. Okay. So then we look over here on the right-hand side. What date was it submitted? Uh, one, yeah, one... 2495, sorry, January 24th, 1995. Now, you give it a laboratory number. What, how, how do you come up with the laboratory number? Uh, the laboratory number is actually the, the first one, two, three, four, five digits are the date stamp. So that came in in five, the year five, so 1995, 01 January, and 24 would be January 24th. So those okay. first five numbers are that kind of that date stamp. The last three numbers, sorry. Go ahead. The last three numbers mean that's the 11th submission of evidence that was received in our evidence control center on that day. And S? S means the, the case was assigned to the scientific analysis section. And the ZJ? ZJ, that is the symbols for the examiner that was assigned the case. Uh, his name was Robert Fram. When it's Robert Fram, he doesn't, it's not by his initials, was it? Correct. We identify the case, in this instance, based on his examiner's symbols. Okay. And the reason is two people can have the same initials, so we utilize these symbols, or we utilized these symbols in order to uniquely identify uh, an examiner within the laboratory division at a certain time. And who was it that it shows uh, delivered by? Uh, as you stated earlier, it was delivered, identified, it was being delivered by W.C., I believe it's Tatum M. Woods. Okay. And who is the suspect that it has listed here? The suspect was identified as David Perry. Okay. And the victim? Uh, victim was identified as Mary Catherine Edwards. Okay. And this was, a, it says, a homicide. Has the agency case number? Is this the case number from the Beaumont Police Department? Right below homicide? It is. Uh, it is. The Did submitting, to, to, my, to my knowledge, that's my best estimate, it is their uh, unique or their case identification number, correct? Okay. And the place and date of the offense was January 14th, 95, at 10.05 Park Meadow in Beaumont, Texas. Is that correct? That's correct. That's what it's identified here. So let's go down and look and see what the brief facts say. Can you read off what the brief facts say on this case? Okay, reading from this, this form, victim was found dead in her apartment. One, I can't tell if it's a 24 or a 14, looks like it's been written over, 95 at 2 o'clock p.m. I'm assuming it's 114. She had been handcuffed behind her back and drowned in her bathtub. Circumstantial evidence up to this time indicates her ex-boyfriend, parentheses, Perry, close parentheses, is our best suspect at this point. So at that point, they were looking at a person by the name of David Perry, am I right? Looking at that point. Based on the, uh, the information on this form, that is correct. Now, when you look here at this and you look up here at the suspect, it's pretty obvious who they're trying to, to say did it, am I right? That's correct. Okay. Now, down here, we have a, do we have an inventory, a description of what was delivered to you? We do. 
And can you kind of just briefly go over what was delivered to you? Certainly. Starting from the top and working my way down, uh, there were baggies of hair found on victim's body during autopsy. Um, and we identified those or uh, subdivided those into 12 different items. That is Q1 or questioned item 1 through questioned item 12. So 12 different items within that, within those baggies of hair. And next? Next, baggies containing unknown substances found on victim's body. Those were identified or further subdivided as Q13 through Q16. So it was subdivided into four different items of evidence for our analysis. Okay, next. Blue and white sheet uh, fitted, which was identified as Q19. And after that? Blue and white top sheet, which was identified as specimen Q20. And next. Comforter identified as specimen Q21. And then the Pillowcases identified as specimens Q22 and Q23. And underneath those, we start with victims. Uh, victims combed pubic hair was identified as specimen Q27. Next. Below that, victims loose head hair, which was identified as specimen Q26. Pulled head, vic, sorry, I apologize. Victims pulled head hair, which is identified as specimen K1 or known item number one. So that's because we know who we came from. That is correct. Okay. Next. Victims pulled pubic hair, which is identified as specimen K2. And the next. Fingernail scrapings, right hand, identified as specimen Q18. Fingernail scrapings, left hand identified as specimen Q17. Uh, let's turn the page or look on the back of yours, I guess. What is this top of the page? Suspects pulled head hair was identified as specimen K3. And next? Suspect pulled pubic hair identified as specimen K4. And next? Suspects blood specimen identified as K5. Underneath that, there's something about a file box. What, what did that file box uh, First item it contained was identified as the victim's nightshirt, specimen Q24. And the next item? Blue and black towel covering vict body, specimen identified as specimen Q25. And what's that last thing underneath there? Just this plastic bag. Uh, it just says plastic bag. It was apparently did not contain evidence for us to examine. Otherwise, my assumption is it would have been identified as an item of evidence. Okay. So looking at what you received, uh, I'm going to show you a couple of items to see if they match what we were just talking about. I'm going to start with the cleaning stuff. Now, when you have bags of evidence to... Is there somewhere where somebody would write something on that back? And I'm showing you States Exhibit 38. States Exhibit 38. Okay. Okay. And I'm gonna hold it up so you don't have to have a towel. I don't even gloves or anything. Okay. This. What does this appear to be? That appears to be a towel. Black and. Black and what? black and blue towel. And looking at this towel, are there markings on there that you recognize? Yes, there are. The the written in Sharpie in the bottom left-hand corner, corner of this towel, I see uh, an item number and the initials of the uh, the examiner that worked on the case. And who is that? Specimen uh, Q25, Robert B. Fram. Okay. Does Mr. Fram work for the FBI anymore? He does not. Is he retired or? He retired. Okay. So this matches up with the Q25 that was delivered on January 24th, 1995. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, was any, the testing that was done on, on these things, was, was there just, uh, was this taken to the trace laboratory? This 
All of these items were were taken to the trace laboratory, and that's where the inventory actually happened. And then after that inventory, again, identifying them as specimens Q1 through, et cetera, what, then, the, then the analysis happened in what, the trace laboratory. What does trace laboratory do? Trace evidence, we examine evidence for um, hairs and fibers. Yes, sir. And when you're examining those, what, what is the process that you use to, to find the hairs and fibers? The evidence would first be taken by, typically by a technician, into what we call a scraping room or a clean room, and the evidence would be scraped um, with, it's, it's basically the same type of instrument you would use to frost a cake, but we hang it over clean paper, scrape the item to remove any debris that had been adhering to it, collect that debris, place it in, we call them plastic pill boxes, just small little plastic containers. From that point, they are then mounted onto glass microscope slides and then analyzed using um, either or both stereo and compound microscopy. So each one of these items that we're looking at was taken in and done, were they done separately? They would al always be done separately and victims' right. items would be handled separately and on a different day from suspects' items, yes. So let's look at States Exhibit 37. Let's see if this you recognize anything on this. Sure. Yes, this was identified as specimen Q24. Again, uh, the upper left portion of where we're looking at, and then the initials RBF or Robert B. Fram. And again, this was also taken to the trace laboratory. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, the purpose of getting the trace was to compare with the suspect's hair and pubic hairs. Is that correct? That is correct. Do you know if that was done? Yes, it was. And I know that Mr. Fram rendered a report to those results. Were those positive or negative for matching Mr. Perry, who was a suspect? To summarize, they were, there were negative results to the hair and fiber examinations. Now, you also received a comforter. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, let's mark the states and get 45. I think we found the plastic bag. Let's look at states and get the 45. I apologize for the smell of it being sitting in. Do you recognize anything on State's Exhibit 45 that you would recognize? Yes, in the bottom right-hand corner, it was identified as specimen Q21, and again, the initials of the examiner RBF, Robert B. Fram. Now, this particular item has some cuttings that have some initials, but do you recognize those or do you not recognize uh, Could you lift up so I can see Sorry. the initials? Uh, too far away. I can't. Okay, I can't. Sorry. I can't see them. I I do not specifically okay. recognize those initials. So that no. did not possibly come from your laboratory. Is that correct? I I cannot. I cannot opine on okay. that. No. So if we have somebody else come along and identify them, then you that would be their initials. So correct. Okay. So let's look at what we got. Yes. What, is, what does this appear to be? It appears to be a flat sheet. Okay. And it was identified in the FBI laboratory as specimen Q20. Again, I recognize the initials of Robert B. Fram. Okay. So this is another thing that was taken and, and looked at in the trace laboratory. Is that correct? That is correct. So what's the number on that? The identification? It is a state's exhibit. 45, no. That's not 45. Yes, sir. That's 
Yes, sir. The same box the comforter was in. Correct. It all okay. came together. It all did come together in the same box. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. yes. Okay. And looking at this item, what does this appear to be? That appears to be a pillowcase. Okay. And do you have seen anything that you recognize off of it? Yes, in the bottom right-hand corner, specimen Q23, and again, the initials RBF. Okay. We have, what does this appear to be? A uh, pillowcase. And what is it? Identify specimen Q22, and uh, again, the initials RBF. These were taken, these pillowcases were taken also to the Trace Laboratory, all of these items, were they, were they not? They were. Okay. So also in stage 45, let's see, we have, what does this appear to be? Appears to be a fitted sheet. Okay. And do you recognize anything on the fitted sheet? Yes, I see the uh, FBI laboratory marking the specimen Q19, and then again the initials RBF. So all these came in the laboratory at the same time in the same container were taken and looked at in the trace laboratory? Correct. And again, when they were processed back up, do you recognize the tape on, on this bag that it was taken out of at one point? That is consistent with the evidence tape that was utilized in the FBI laboratory at that time, yes. So in order to keep it sealed up at some point, it had this FBI tape. That is correct. Now, that this 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 stuff that I just showed you, all these, these this comforter, it came from Stacy number 45. How long did it stay in your laboratory? By, long by long? laboratory, do you mean the trace evidence laboratory the trace evidence or the FBI laboratory? The trace evidence laboratory, trace evidence laboratory yes. Um, it was processed um, on or about that time and then a number of items were moved on for uh, subsequent analysis in the DNA unit on January 27th, 1995, and then a number of different items uh, were moved on for what we call the materials analysis unit on January 27th, 1995. Now, the, the stuff that was moved off to the DNA laboratory, was there ever any DNA results or any testing done DNA-wise? Or did it, was it sent somewhere else? If I may look at the, I believe a DNA report was rendered. I apologize, there were numerous reports rendered on this, uh, on this case. There was a, a DNA report rendered on June 23rd, 1995, which discussed some serological analysis that was conducted on um, a couple of items, but then it was stated that um, no further serological or DNA analysis would be conducted in the FBI laboratory. Okay, so basically they did, well, they do some blood typing? Correct. And not DNA testing? That's correct. So. Would, does it state the purpose why if there was no more DNA testing done on it? It's stated in the report, um, will not, the submitted items will not undergo further serological or deoxyribonucleic acid DNA analysis in the FBI laboratory in as much as DNA examinations on the sexual assault examination kit are already being performed by Cellmark Incorporated. Okay, so since Cellmark was already looking at this as in the DNA fashion, the FBI lab decided we don't need to test it because it'd be too many labs doing too many different things. It would be better to have one lab conduct all of the same type of testing, correct? Okay. So one of the items that you received, or two of the items, was Q817 and Q18. What were those? Q, say them again, please. Q17 I'm sorry. and Q18. Q17 and Q18 were identified as the fingernail clippings recovered from the victim. Okay. Why were they Qs instead of known? 
because we're not interested, for, from our standpoint, forensically, we're not interested in the actual clippings. It's potentially what is found underneath the fingernails or on those clippings. So we identify them as question items because we don't know what is there. Okay, let me show you what has been marked as States Exhibit 35A. Let's see if you recognize that, in, that, that plastic and see if you can tell me what, what identifiers you recognize on I recognize the FBI laboratory number up here on the top, including um, S and ZJ, and then also have specimen Q17 through Q18, and then again the initials RBF. So those fingernail clippings were contained within, or scrapings, were they clippings? I apologize. Okay. Fingernail clippings were contained within that plastic bag. So let me ask you, as far as these are concerned, when they come in an envelope like this, would your laboratory accept them if they were not sealed? We would accept them. We would probably note that they were not sealed, correct. Is there anything in there noting that these were not sealed? Uh, if I may check to the sure. check on the technician's actual notes. I see no markings saying that um, they weren't in a sealed position. Okay. So They're looking at Step seven, we've got the right and left fingernail scrapings and clippings. Oh, it says scrapings. Do you recognize each one of these? Let's start with the step seven, the left hand fingernail scraping. What item is that? I see the, the marking, FBI laboratory markings for specimen Q17 and the initials RBF. And just for the record, Judge, this is takes exhibit 35 that I'm reading out of the, these envelopes came from. So Q17, RBF, that's... The same. left hand, correct. Okay, that's the same Robert Fram. Same right? Robert P. Fram, correct. Okay, and what is the right hand? Right hand, I see the the initial or the specimen identification is specimen Q18, and again the initials RBF. Okay, and these were brought into the laboratory again, and were they brought to the trace laboratory? Yes, they were. And at the trace laboratory, what was what was done with them? What the trace laboratory? Uh, the technician would have looked underneath each of those fingernail clippings, scrapings, whatever it happened to be, to identify any possible hairs or fibers. Those would have been mounted on glass microscope slides and then further analyzed. Any Anything that, that showed that they matched any of the, the David Perry suspects? No. Okay. Look at stage 34. Now this item, you recognize it. Let me just get this up here. 34A. No, 34. 34B. First, let's start with 34B. You recognize this, this plastic? Yes, this is from um, FBI Laboratory number 50517058, again, SZJ, uh, assigned to Robert Fram. It's specimen K18. I see the specimen identification and the initials RBF. And when did K18, did it come into your laboratory the same time all the others came in? It did not. It came in subsequently. Okay. It was received on May 17th, 1995. And how did it come to your laboratory? Um, it was mailed into our evidence control center. Um, I have the, the the parcel method and number, if if that's necessary. But, but it, was mailed, it was mailed in a box. So to when you received it, was there anything, any notations that it was not sealed? There's no indication in the notes, no. Okay. So what happened when this got to your laboratory? What what became of, of K-18? Specimen K-18 would have been inventoried in the trace evidence unit. Um, that would have been by Robert Fram and his technician. And it's it went to trace, even though trace evidence wasn't going to work on a blood sample, since trace evidence was responsible for that case with that first submission of evidence, uh, that's why it came to the trace evidence unit. But in this case, it came to the unit, but since no further analysis was going to be conducted on it, it did not leave the trace evidence unit. It was maintained within the trace evidence unit. Okay. And was it finally sent back to where it came from somewhere? Yes, it was. And do you know what date that was? 
I do. Uh, the that uh, that item was sent back to. Uh, I believe it was to the Beaumont Police Department okay. on August 16th, 1995, okay. by a registered mail. Okay. So when y'all send something off, it's still in the sealed condition. It came into your, your office, in, is that right? That the is the normal right? course of business, yes. And so it was mailed off, no notes that there was any unsealed condition at all? No. Right? Okay. Let's talk about the fingernail scrapings in States of 35. This was... Uh, Q17 and Q18, when were they returned or sent out of your laboratory and where were they sent? Uh, they were actually returned with the, the specimen I just discussed on that same date, 8 16, sorry, August 16th, 1995, under that same registered mail number. Okay. What about the comforter <coughs> that we had? <coughs> sorry, this Excuse me. Nope, yeah. you're good. Okay. Let's talk about the comforter and the sheets. Which is Q19, 20, 21, and 22. When were they sent back? And where were they sent? With the same, actually sent back with the, with the evidence that I just discussed on August 16th, 1995, under that same registered mail. All of those submissions of evidence were submitted, or returned to the contributor uh, at the same time. Okay, and everything would have been sealed up separately so that when it got there, it would, it would stay separate, no cross-contamination. That is correct. That is our normal course of business. So was anything else sent to you for any type of testing after those were sent back in August of 95? Yes, there was one additional submission of evidence. What was that? Um, evidence received July 19th, 95, 1995, uh, two head hair samples and two pubic hair samples, so four known hair samples. Okay, were they from different suspects? They were from two different personnel, correct. And who were they? Uh, first two, K19 and K20, were identified as the head and pubic hair sample, respectively, from Scott J. Peters. K21 and K22 were identified as the head hair and pubic hair sample, respectively, from Mark A. Terrell. And were any of those compared to the prior samples that were sent, of known samples of uh, that were found at the scene? Did anything match them? Uh, those samples were analyzed and compared to the, pre the debris taken from the previous items, again, with negative results. Okay. So, yes, there were microscopic hair comparisons that, conducted. Yes, sir. And was that the last that was sent to your laboratory to be tested on this case? That is correct. Okay. I'll pass away Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Major. Uh, it's just Mr. Oyen. Are you not Major? I am not. How many years? 29? <laughs> I am not. Okay. Sir, um, I think you talked talk about it. Uh, is there a um, Keith Halvin in your department with the FBI? Do you know of him? Yes, I did know him. He is no longer with the uh, FBI laboratory, but Keith Howland was the DNA examiner, serology and DNA examiner assigned to this case. And do you know why? Selmark would be sending uh, a unlabeled purple top mm -hmm. tube of blood to him and on May 12th of 1995. If I showed you something, would it may help you? Is that, uh, I, I just found, is that the... Yeah, no, that's your first good number right there. Do you have that? Yeah, that's file number. I don't see anything. Oh, wait. So that's. Okay, yes, this is, that is the, um, 
the 5051-7058 submission of evidence that was received in the FBI laboratory. As far as your question, I apologize. Uh, the why, I, I don't know. I can't surmise can't that. Tell. But it had nothing, if it went to the DNA, was that possibly for comparison of some other sample? That would be the normal course of business, yes. The DNA, <clears throat> DNA an analyst would need a known sample to compare any information he recovers from question items, correct. But you have nothing in your records of why they, or what they were analyzing or why they would get blood from a purple top uh, to the blood to Well, we know from that first item of evidence that some question items were submitted to DNA for analysis. My assumption is that the purple top, or the I guess what's identified as a purple top, was submitted well, as a known sample to be compared against. Right, but you have nothing in reference to those results or anything like that. Um, I, as I read in the report earlier, the only testing that was done was on a, a number of the question items, and then a determination was made not to conduct further DNA analysis in the FBI laboratory. Well, and, and the reason why I ask is. Because, yes, I, I hear that, that you don't want to do it, but someone requested it, and it was sent up to the FBI in May of, of 1995 uh, for some type of analysis. We don't know what, based on what you've testified to. Um, but then later on, sometime in July, it was determined, well, if Selmark's doing it, then we're not going to do it. Is that basically it? That, that's my understanding, yes. But in May, someone decided that they needed to do something in the FBI. But we don't know what. I, I can't determine where the decision was made, no. Based on what you have here in reference to the reports uh, from your analyst, uh, these Q hairs from the body, uh, Q1 through 4, Q5 through 12, the debris from the body, um, were they analyzed to see whether or not it came from the known victim, uh, which was Captain Evans? Or was that, would that be protocol to, to make sure that we're not looking at her here? Uh, it was not stated as such in the report. The, they stated, uh, what was stated in the report that there were no hairs like those in the known hair samples identified as coming from the suspect were found. Were there, were there samples from the uh, victim submitted? Yes, I believe those were the first two known items that were submitted, uh, K1 and K2, that is correct. So when I see that there was no comparison, does that mean that they were not compared, the, the samples that were given to you, the Qs, were not compared to the Ks of the known victim? or? They were, but they were ruled out. Uh, I'm looking at the actual examiner's notes, and I see notations in the actual handwritten notes that uh, there were hairs that were found in those question items that were like the victim, but that information was not put in the report. Why? Personal <laughs> preference of, uh, of the examiner uh, at the time? Because... In the submittal, at the autopsy, there were light-colored hair, there were dark-colored hair, there were red hair. What hair do you think they omitted from your report? I can't, I can't yes, speak to that. Because it wasn't your report. Correct. But there's nothing indicating which hairs they said compared or didn't compare. In which specific hairs on the glass microscope slides? Right. Correct. Somewhere in the summer of 95, you sent everything back, or your agency sent everything back to Beaumont? Is that what you testified to? Correct. Uh, it appears it was on August 16th, 1995, yes. And you didn't do any DNA testing on the nail clippings. You were just looking for trace, uh, like blood or something like, like a hair. Uh, I think he testified to it. Who's the 
Uh, I'm checking right now. Uh, specimens, the fingernail clippings Q17 and Q18 were sent on for DNA analysis. To they did what, go to what agency? within the FBI laboratory. And the results? Uh, I have to look at his report if if he. Specifically from um, his report, specimens Q17 through Q23, Q17 and Q18 would be those clippings, uh, and Q25 were examined for the presence of blood. However, none was found. Was that done through DNA, or was that just done to try to see if there was any blood and possible blood type that they could compare? That was identified in the report as being serological analysis, so that would be the blood typing level of things, not the DNA, not DNA analysis. Of blood type. Correct. And the only blood type that you would possibly have is one of the victims, and the other one is just a Perry, uh, man, uh, David Perry. I guess that was submitted to y'all. We did have the blood sample of the victim, yes. And uh, David Perry, I think, was the other man, or suspect, right? I believe that was the initial. Yes, the first, in the very first submission of evidence, specimen K5 was a blood sample identified as being from suspect, which in this, at that time was David Perry, correct. At any time after 95, were you all asked to do any more comparisons? Not to my knowledge, no. Nothing in your report reflects they ever sent anything back to the FBI? Other than the, the four submissions of evidence that we've talked about, no. And ultimately, it all went back. Correct. You did get some more samples to test later on that year. I think you tested, and there were two other individuals uh, that you tested. Was that for hair, or was that for blood? Tell me what the, what the all tested for. The very last submission of evidence, uh, that 5071-9001, that was the four hair samples, so the two head hair and two pubic hair samples identified as coming from Scott J. Peters and Mark Terrell. So only hair samples. And no comparison there? No report saying they, or was a comparison ever done? There was, there was a report rendered by uh, Mr. Fram comparing no hairs microscopically like those in those four samples I just mentioned, K19 through K22, were found in the debris from the previously submitted items Q1 through 27. So those very first items that, that we talked about. So yes, a comparison was done. No hairs like any of those known samples were found on those items. If they had come across some other suspects and had taken other samples, hair samples, because that's basically what you testified to, or trace samples, would your agency have been able to compare what you had tested on or tested for back in 95 at a later date? Uh, specific to hair, it, it depends. Anything. They, they sent you a whole bunch of stuff, right? Correct. And, and you took, you got hair, you got a whole, whole bunch of things. One through 25, uh, 27, questionable. Uh, if somebody, and I know that after you did your initial testing, you ruled out Perry, and then they sent some more stuff on. You ruled out two other individuals for the hair and whatever else they did. If at a later date, my question is, if at a later date they sent you some more stuff in reference, oh, I got another suspect, uh, could you have done the analysis, your agency? Yes, and I'd have to go back to what I said before. It depends on what the later date is, specifically with reference to microscopic hair comparison analyses. As we get older, our hair changes with time. When I started with the FBI, I had brown hair, maybe black hair. Now, not, not so much. So with hair specifically, 
the, the longer you wait between the date of the deposition of the potential question items and the collection of the known sample, it gets harder and harder to do because you may have what we would call you know, a false exclusion. Well, we, can't, we can do the comparison, say they're different, but it could have been because hairs have changed over time. That's specific to hairs, but with other, speci other types of evidence, DNA, uh, fibers, Yes, we could have conducted further analysis later on. And when you made that explanation of hair, I mean, you're talking about possibly decades, uh, because you said when you first started, you had a lot of hair, brown. Exactly. And, and it's gray. Uh, so you're talking about a long period of time. But I'm talking about like within a year or so or a year and a half. Those could, could have been comparable. That is correct, yes. Thank you. Pass the witness up to uh, recall your arm. Anything else? No, Your Honor.
State your name for the record, please. David Middleman. And Mr. Middleman, where do you work? I work at Authram. Authram is what? Authram's a forensic laboratory. We do uh, advanced DNA testing um, in support of law enforcement investigations um, or, or other members of the criminal justice community. Okay, and we had you scheduled to testify either tomorrow or Friday, is that correct? Yes, sir. You had a family issue come up, and so we decided to call you today to get, get you out of town, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So let's, let's talk about um, Authram Laboratories. When was Authram Laboratories established? Authram was established in uh, September of 2018. And what type of work does Authram do as far as the testing? Authram works in a, in a very narrow and focused kind of area of DNA testing. So um, in a criminal investigation, when conventional forensic testing, uh, sometimes called CODIS testing or STR testing, is utilized and is not able to generate leads in a case, um, after that process occurs, we have another kind of testing that we can offer that can generate investigative leads and help drive a case forward. So we work very narrowly in that one technique. We don't do anything else. And our work is uh, used by law enforcement to identify either suspects or victims uh, from crime scenes. So let's get this straight. Whenever you talk about being a forensic laboratory, you do not compare DNA from the sample from the crime scene to an individual to see if it's that same individual, do you? Not, not using traditional methods, no. Right. What you do is, is use uh, a method that, is, that develops a profile. From that profile, you can point law enforcement in a general direction as far as family and, and help them decipher which direction to go to, to towards the suspect. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So let's, let's talk about what the process is. So let's say I'm law enforcement, and I call you up and I say, hey, we have a, a case like in this, a cold case that we're trying to develop a lead on. What's the first thing that we need to do to get into your laboratory? So the first thing we'll do is an extensive case review. We'll look at, you know, a lot of these cases have, have languished for years, and a lot of work's been done, and we want to recognize that. So the first thing we'll do is an extensive case review of the documents. We'll meet with investigators, and, and we'll try to figure out what's been done and why that has not been successful. Because we usually step in, as I said, after there's been a traditional attempt with STR or CODIS testing. Once we understand that, we'll then secondarily look to see what evidence is available. And sometimes there's a lot of different pieces of evidence, sometimes there's no evidence, and then we can't help. But if we identify a piece of evidence, we'll make a recommendation back to the law enforcement agency and tell them that with this evidence, we think we can achieve this amount of information that could lead to an investigative uh, uh, you know, uh, breakthrough. And, and then if it does, they'll do the rest of their investigation using the traditional labs and so on to, to close out the case. Um, once we mutually agree that we've got a piece of evidence that we feel comfortable helping with, we don't accept all cases, and the agency wants to move forward, then we'll register the case in our data system and the evidence that they have um, or the work product of that evidence sometimes is a derivative work product like a DNA extract or, or some sampling of original evidence. That is then sent to our laboratory. That can be done in person, can be done through a carrier, and, and then we'll begin a secondary set of review because it's one thing to read the case files, then we want to come in and look at the actual material ourselves. Again, be sure that we think we can help. We don't want to get involved if we're not going to be able to help. And at that point, we'll let them know we're ready to actually proceed. We'll do the testing, and uh, that may or may not involve extracting additional DNA, and then it will result in the building of a DNA profile that is uh, different than the ones that you may have heard of um, you know, from others that testify from like public labs. It's a profile that has hundreds of thousands of data points in it, and it can be used in a number of ways, as you alluded to, to generate new leads in the investigation. Okay, so you're not preparing anything to go and be placed into CODIS because that's already been done with the STR testing, is that correct? That's correct, and, and, and more importantly, we don't offer any of those services. We specifically don't offer those services because those are well covered by public labs. Now, your, your laboratory is, the, the type of work you do is not required to be certified by the Texas, by the state of Texas as a, as a laboratory, to be a certified laboratory. Yeah, we do not offer any accredited kind of standard CODIS testing. That's, we do something very different. So, as a matter of fact, the, the type of work you do really hasn't been listed as part of the ones that's required to be accredited. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. So, in this case, with the victim of Mary Catherine Edwards, were you asked to look at the evidence in this case? 
Yes, we were asked to review the case and make a recommendation as to whether we could participate in a productive way. And what recommendation did y'all come up with? The recommendation we made is that given that there was DNA available, given that there was a previous accredited STR profile developed, given that it was searched in CODIS and came up with no leads, we decided based on those factors we'd recommend building a different kind of profile to see if we could generate investigative leads that would lead to um, you know, the attribution of where that DNA came from. So did you have some evidence sent or brought to your laboratory? Yes, sir. We had two items that were brought to us. And what was that? Do you remember? We had uh, swabs. They were vaginal swabs that were collected by law enforcement at the time that the crime scene was investigated, and secondarily, a piece of fabric uh, that was derived from a comforter. Okay. And did you call those items a one and two? We did. We, we labeled them numerically in the order in which we examined them. Okay. And do you remember when they were received in your laboratory? Uh, my memory, but it should be documented, my memory is that we would have received the items uh, via a carrier, I think it was FedEx, on the 1st of uh, April in 2020, um, and then uh, they would then be in the queue to be processed by our lab personnel, which would have happened uh, some days afterwards. Okay. Let me show you what's marked as State's Exhibit 109. Do you recognize anything on State's Exhibit 109? Uh, yes, sir. There's a, a number that begins with an alphanumeric header OCN. This stands for Authram Case Number, and this is the prefix that we would assign um, when we receive the first evidence in a case. And is there also a case number assigned to it? There is. Do you and want me to read the case? Yes, if you read that. The, the case number is OCN 200401-01. Now, the, the number, does it have a specific meaning within your laboratory about when you receive the evidence and how you gave the number? Yes, the number OCN stands for Authorum Case Number. The next digits, 2 and 0, stand for the year. It was 2020 that we received this. The 04 stands for the month, April, in which we received that first evidence. The 01 stands for the 1st of April. And the dash 01 means it was the first item that arrived on the 1st of April. Okay. So when you received this, would it have been in a sealed condition? Yes, sir. Would you have accepted it if it was not in a sealed condition? We will not. We will photograph it and report back that there was a tampering or damage to the evidence. Okay. So after opening it inside, were there two more smaller plastic envelopes or bags? Yes. And uh, let's look at State's Exhibit 109C, let's say do V1. What is what is that? So, so this item has... Uh, documentation from another laboratory um, that had probably uh, examined uh, this item as well. But what I can see here is that we've again marked the OCN uh, number, which was a 200401-01. Now we've appended an additional 01, because that's the first item in this first case that we received today. And it's got a signature from uh, my analyst uh, documenting on 4-7-2020 that uh, she examined this piece. So it arrived on the 1st and would have been examined um, on the 7th. Do you recognize the analyst that, that opened that? Yes. Who is that? This is Christy Smeagol. Okay. And you're personally familiar with, with who she is? Yes. And let's look at inside 109V and see what, what is inside that? What is that? Um, this indicates that there um, are a, a piece of a vaginal swab and it's got an additional identifier that came from the agency. Okay. Does it also have anything with Authorum's laboratory number on it? Um, it, it? Per our standard, we also document on the top left corner, as you can see, the same case number, okay. and not just the case number, but the item number. Okay. So no matter how far you uh, track down, you've got essentially an identifier in every package and sub-package. Does that have the same unique case number to it? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Now, in contained in this, what is contained in, in this... States Exhibit 109V? In, in, in this piece would have been a piece of a swab um, that is labeled vaginal swab. Okay. And for the record, earlier I said 109V. This is 109V1 is the plastic envelope. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And then we look at 109C1. Do you recognize that? Yes. This, uh, this is identified using the same initial case number, but instead of the last two numbers being 01, they're 02 because this is the second item in this case that we received on April 1st. Okay. And the same person received it, is that correct? Yes, sir. Same person opened it on the same date? Yes. 
And then inside of 109C1 is 109C, and do you recognize that? Yes. What is that? Um, this is an additional sealed envelope. Um, item two would have contained a piece of fabric. Okay, and that's on the other side. What does it say it is? Um, on the other side, again, we've uh, uh, repeated our case number, OCN 20041-01. It's again signed by the analyst, dating that on the 7th of April it was examined, and the agency has indicated that more specific than fabric, it's from a comforter. Now, y'all did not receive the comfort, you just received the cutting, is that correct? That's correct. It's very uncommon for us to receive primary evidence. We receive uh, either a work product or a subsampling. So when, when you received these items, they were both uniquely sealed. They were sealed when they arrived at your laboratory, is that correct? Yes, sir. And when they're examined in your office, are they examined separately, each individual item separately? Yes, and, and more, uh, more carefully, they're examined in a private room. So we have a private room in which only one item is opened, and that item is completely uh, put back together before any other item can be introduced into that room. Okay. So was there testing done on those two items? We did initial testing on both items, uh, hoping that one item would be productive for follow-up testing, and we decided to move forward with item one. Okay, which one was that? Item one is the vaginal swab. And were you able to develop a profile out of that? Yes, sir. Now, when you develop one, do you issue a report, a genotype kit report? If the agency asks, we can generate a genotype kit report that documents essentially the, the properties of the profile that we built. So what, what is a genotype kit report for? What is it used for? So um, when we build, it's used for a number of things, but when we build a DNA profile, this profile may have hundreds of thousands of DNA markers on it. It's got lots of little markers. And some of the markers are from um, you know, one chromosome versus another. Some of the markers represent information from mom and dad. Some are just from mom or dad. So we basically have a little table of, of numbers where we basically say we got this much information from here, this much information from here. And that report can be used. Uh, sometimes it's just a document that we did the work, and that's, that's how labs get paid, is you have to document you did something. Okay. Uh, it's also used to document the, the suitability of that report. It's like a QC metric. Is that data usable for the next step? Um, so, so we'll generate it upon a request uh, for any number of reasons. So what, what can you do with this report besides get paid? Um, this report allows you to, uh, to essentially document the suitability of this profile for further analysis. And this profile can then be used um, to do anything from uh, comparisons um, to, to other profiles, to uh, genetic genealogy, to uh, analysis of uh, biogeographical ancestry. So you can, you can look at the markers and determine the historical origins of where someone may have originated. So when you get when you get the profile, the profile is entered into another database. Is that correct? We'll perform an analysis ourselves, but then yes, investigators can enter it into other databases, um, perform other operations. There's there's lots of applications for using the data, as there is with STR testing. Um, our our job at the laboratory is just to build a profile that is suitable and meets essentially the metrics. Um, I, I didn't mention, but something else in that report is it shows you kind of the thresholds, like what, what are the requirements for us to say this profile is one that we stand by and think is suitable for further analysis? Let's just look at, look, let's just sure. change 127, look at it. Yes. Is that the report we're talking about? Yes, sir. And is that an accurate copy of it? I, I believe so, yes. Yeah. Okay. Just so the jury knows what we've been looking at. This says genotype kit report, is that right? Yes, sir. And this is the outcome ID number that you gave a while ago as far as what was tested? That's the case number, yes. Okay. And it tells what was tested in this, which was the item ID uh, vaginal swab, is that right, item one? Yes, sir. Now, it came from, who's the case leader agency? Uh, it was the Beaumont Police Department. Okay. And you can see there's also a cross-reference to the agency ID that was provided to us on the right. So looking at these vaginal swabs, it says a heavy non-human DNA burden was detected. What does that mean? So sometimes when evidence has been sitting around for a while, no matter how well the investigators try to keep it, 
um, it's organic material, and so there's things that can develop on it, uh, bacteria, um, other kinds of things. I mean, it was not, it's not held in a sterile situation. And so the uh, bacteria and non-human elements can make it tougher to read the data that's in the profile. Okay. Uh, but it's possible to still read it? Yes, and if it's not possible, we'll indicate that. Okay. So you were able to, even though there was the non-human DNA burden was detected, you still were able to come up with... Uh, a reading or a profile. And, and the way you know that is if you look, for example, at where it says uh, autosomes, you can see we, we want to see at least 50% of the markers that we want to call called. And you can see that in, in actuality we had, uh, and I'm sorry, my vision is not perfect. 87? Yeah, over 80, yeah, it looks like 87%. So that's, that's, that's far in excess of what is necessary to produce a workable profile. So you can see that there was a non human burden, but it did not impact our ability to build a decent profile. What's the no calls? The no calls means that's how many calls that we would ordinarily make that we were not able to make. So we'll never get 100% of the markers that we're targeting. Um, but again, you can see in the total there are you know over 600,000 markers that we are targeting, um, and we ended up with over half a million. Um, and that's in contrast, for example, to CODIS, where you get 20 markers. So we have a half a million data points that we've very uh, carefully and, and accurately curated to take us to the next step. What are these numbers down here we're looking at? So, so this is where I was talking about earlier, um, and sorry for the jargon, but um, when you get your DNA from mom and dad, um, you know, all your DNA comes, you have two copies, one from mom and one from dad. If you have a different copy of information from mom and dad, then, then science folks will call this heterozygosity. They'll say you have two different versions. If mom and dad give you the same genetic information, which sometimes they will, they call that homozygosity. And we monitor this because um, if you have something that is you know, beyond what is expected, something that's really skewed, it could be, again, evidence that perhaps the profile is, uh, you know, has a problem with it or is, is lower quality than we'd expect. So what did we come out here? Um, we, we like to see profiles that we feel comfortable in that come from one person. We don't want to see them exceed a heterozygosity of 50%. And you can see that we're you know, well below that. Okay. So this passed. Yes, sir. And, I, and I'm sorry for not mentioning that, but the pass is, is our way of indicating that it's met threshold uh, pair our SOPs. Okay. So what have we got here with the X chromosome? So here, this, is, this table shows you the same thing on the left side, but here, as, as, as everyone may know, you have your main chromosomes, and then you've got the X and Y if you're a guy, and you've got the two Xs if you're a woman. And so we look at the X calls. This is a sex chromosome. Um, as an additional level of QC, just to understand a little bit more. But you'll see that the data is, is very consistent, as are the statistics with the, with the autosome. Okay. So this basically is this, but with the X chromosome? Just one chromosome, yes. And, and sometimes that's valuable if you're trying to determine if there's like a mixture, a DNA mixture. But as you can see, both passed as well. Right. So looking down here in the interpretation? We reported in the interpretation that the fact that there was non-human DNA um, could, in principle, make it harder to, uh, to produce these results, and it could, it could maybe make some of the relationships harder to find. So the genealogy, for example, might be more tougher than usual. But this wasn't out of range for what we would expect from an experienced uh, practitioner. And so we, we kind of use this as, a, as, a, as just a warning. Like, this isn't the kind of profile you would get if you swab somebody's mouth last week, and the yeah. DNA is great looking, and it's from yesterday. But, but the profile meets uh, the specifications necessary. And, uh, and in fact, this one was a, was, a, was a pretty decent profile. It's got a very nice call rate. And, and we suspect that someone skilled in the art uh, would be able to then carry on additional analysis. Now, y'all did not carry on the additional analysis in this case, did you? We did not. OK, that, that was some other people that were going to follow up with. Yes, it was led by uh, the Texas Rangers. And then, and then they have other folks they worked with. Right. So after your lab did this, what other, uh, what other participation did you have in the genealogy investigation? We, we didn't participate in the genealogy investigation, but, um, but for example, uh, if someone wants, in the process of genealogy, there may be a, a step where you want to uh, compare a reference DNA sample, and, and, and we'll provide that service as well. So um, we, we were not involved in the investigative part in this case. Sometimes we are. In this case, we were not hired to do that. Um, but we did, we did perform additional comparisons 
um, against reference DNA uh, samples. Those were by family members that they were checking to see if they were heading in the right direction? Yes. And you weren't participating in what they used them for? You just tested them and gave them the number? We prefer to be blinded because this ensures that we're generating data and the people generating the data aren't the ones interpreting it. So, so we don't know what the answer is supposed to be. We're blindly testing it, passing it back to the Texas Ranger, who then does his work to determine what it means to the investigation. Okay. Thanks, sir. I'll pass with you. Okay. Have a second, Dave. Yes, sir. Hello. You said that you did other testing. Um, if if we are asked to do uh, testing, were you asked at this, in this instance to do other testing? Um, I think we may have done some reference DNA testing. Okay. And where are those reports? Um, we won't. Uh, we don't necessarily, unless we're asked to generate a report for that. It's not a forensic process. It's uh, it would not involve forensic evidence or the case. Where is the paperwork when you got the sample? Um, it's possible that the Rangers have it. I can I can find out. Did you generate a report? Um, I'm not sure. Well, you testified to it, and do you follow protocol when you get samples? Yes. And so you have submittal forms and case notes and yes. stuff like that. Yes. Yeah, for forensic casework. So where is that report from the additional testing? If we did a reference DNA sample, we'll provide a profile. And as I said earlier in my testimony, we generate reports if we're asked to. We don't generate reports by default on a reference sample. It's not a forensic case. You said that you did the testing and the reports. Where were they sent? Uh, the Texas Rangers. Can we approach Doug?
uh, questions, and uh, he will need to come back uh, at a later time uh, to okay. so I can cross examine him. You're going to still be under the subpoena. You're released temporarily, and we may need to call you back before the trial is completed for additional testimony. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. And the state knows how to get you. And I know Thank you. you.